Hey everybody, today Rado Talks for episode 38 of the podcast filmed in my mom's guest bedroom here in Washington State. Yes, at long last, Jen and I have made it back home to the good old U.S. of A. And we are currently in the long and arduous process of helping my mom get her affairs in order so we can move her out of here and all three of us can move into a new, presumably final home. At least final for now. We'll see how that goes over the next few weeks. We've got some promising prospects. Fingers crossed, wish me luck, but... In the meantime, the show must go on, so hold on, everybody, and we'll be right back with some new games of interest. Okay, everybody, time for new games of interest. It'll be coming sometime soon, and while last month was a little anemic, this month is delivering in spades. Oh my gosh, so many cool games and expansions. Let me tell you all about them, starting with Thief's Fortune which is actually the latest card drafting game from Artipia Games, and it's got a really, really cool thematic conceit. Imagine uh, Aladdin from you know the Disney movie, or, or even better, Prince of Persia, the video games, you know, kind of a uh, street rat type thief uh, from Arabian Nights who steals a magic gem that allows you to see the future. That's the setting, and each player in this card drafting game is plotting out a potential future for this young thief to claim a lot of fortune and avoid any misfortune. Cool, cool idea, and some very, very neat twists on card drafting as well that kind of push this beyond uh, you know, a standard Seven Wonders clone or something like that. Very, very cool things, and Jen and I actually got to play it before we left England, and I did a rundown on it when it was on Kickstarter. So, I mention all this because apparently it didn't quite catch on fire like the publisher had hoped, and so they stopped the Kickstarter campaign, they took feedback from the backers and the fans and whatnot, and they're going to retool and be relaunching it soon. And I, I hope it does well enough for the next one because this is a very cool game, really combo-tastic, and uh, like I said, some of the changes they make to standard card drafting make it hard to go back to uh, Seven Wonders or what have you. You can learn more in my rundown, but anyway, that's A Thief's Fortune, coming to Kickstarter soon. And then also, this one kind of tickled me pink, Five Minute Marvel. Now this is basically taking the same gameplay system of Five Minute Dungeon, which I've done a run-through for, Jen and I actually both did that one, and r transplanting it into the Marvel Universe. I don't think it's the cinematic universe, I think it's the comic book universe, which suits me better anyway. Um, but to me, it's just such a clever idea. It's such a no-brainer. I think these systems will just transplant beautifully. And I can only assume, with a more mass-market appealing subject matter, that this thing will start showing up in, you know, beyond friendly local game stores. I mean, this seems like a perfect candidate to beer in Walmarts and whatnot. And so, I'm, 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 I, you know, I'm happy with... Five Minute Dungeon, that game suited us fine. We're definitely holding on to the copy we've got. But I, actually, I just got to say, I'm so happy for the publishers that they, I think they're going to catch lightning in a bottle here because it's just a match made in heaven. Five Minute Marvel. Then there is Clank in Space Apocalypse. Expansion content uh, showing that Clank in Space is apparently going to have legs and will be able to live on your shelf right alongside regular Clank. Do we feel like clanking through a dungeon or a space station tonight or a spaceship? Um, I don't know, but the core Clank system is really fun. So, I uh, and you know, and Clank in Space specifically had so much cool, funny reference type cards. I'm just looking forward to see what new, uh, you know, famous science fiction characters will show up. Then, now this is really neat. This is a standalone game that's kind of a sequel to Role Player, which, as you know, I mean, I believe that made our top 10 the year it came out. Jen and I love that to pieces. This very cool, puzzly dice drafting game where players are basically trying to roll up the perfect pen and paper RPG character, but in this incredibly puzzly structure. Just absolutely brilliant, brilliant game. And 
The interesting thing is, after you play role player, once you're done, you just throw that character away. But now you can keep that character and transplant them into role player adventures, which is a standalone fantasy um, role playing adventure board game. Now, you can just play role player adventures and make a new character there to get going, but I love this as a back to back. Hey, let's play a game of role players. Let's create some characters. Now, let's take them out on a full, big, standalone adventure. It's so cool. I cannot wait to see. Considering how good role player was, I, I can't wait to see what um, they do with uh, you know a whole new style of game set in the same universe. I love this. It's such a cool idea. Can't wait to learn more about role player adventures. Then we've got uh, Selenia. And now this is from the designer of Deus. Uh, it's from Pearl Publishing. So right off the bat, I'm already pretty confident this is going to be an amazing game because uh, you know Deus, even though it wasn't as much of a fit for me and Jen as I would have hoped, we still thought it was absolutely brilliant in its design. And I don't. Know, I've read the the explanation of it that's on Board Game Geek right now. And I got to say, I have a very, very hard time getting my head around what it's trying to describe here. Uh, it, it sounds like it's some kind of steampunk floating dirigible uh, transportation game. Uh, you know, you're producing goods and using your dirigibles to transport them around, I guess. But I'm really not quite sure how it is. And honestly, I don't need to look it up. Deus was absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, Twa is phenomenal. Uh, Sebastian Dujardin, uh, the guy is, you know, he's a, an incredible designer. And if all that weren't enough, he's teaming up with artist Vincent Dutre, which I'm just going to say he's my favorite game artist of all time now. So more gorgeous Vincent Dutre art in some kind of steampunk fantasy universe. Uh, Sebastian Dujardin designing it, Pearl Games publishing it. That's a perfect storm right there. I got to expect this is probably going to be one of my most anticipated games, I'm assuming going into Essen Spiel uh, 20... Uh, what, what year is it? Oh, 2018? And actually, man, the existence of this makes me kind of sad that chances are Jen and I won't be at Essence Spiel this year because I want to play this as soon as possible. I mean, what an incredible combination of development talent. So I'm definitely looking forward to Selenia. Cannot wait to learn more. All right, then we've got Shadow on Crossfire, the Prime Runner Edition. And this has been a long time in coming. I guess it's probably going to get launched at Gen Con next month. That would be my assumption, just like Shadowrun Crossfire did years ago now. And I know a lot of people have been very anxiously awaiting this because, um, you know, a regular Shadowrun Crossfire never really quite got the love that it deserved, seeing as how it's my second highest ranked game of all time. So I'm definitely interested to see what they do going back to the drawing board. I'm a little nervous, though, because quite frankly, while I'm a huge fan of Dragonfire, which is the fantasy version of Shadowrun Crossfire, I felt they kind of took some of the teeth out of the game, especially for two-player, and almost made it too easy. And I suspect a lot of the tweaks and balances and adjustments that were applied to Dragonfire will be retrofitted into Shadowrun Crossfire Prime Runner Edition. So, I would not be surprised if after I end up playing this, I decide, yeah, really cool. I can see why some people would like it, but I'll probably stick with my original Shadowrun. But I'm looking forward to trying it out because uh, so far, this cool adventure cooperative a deck building game with you know kind of ongoing you know permanence in a campaign setting has just been absolutely phenomenal no matter how I play it. And so more is good in my opinion with Shadowrun Crossfire the Prime Runner edition. And hey, speaking of Dragonfire, there's going to be another character pack coming out. Heroes of the Wild, which will add 32 new character archetypes to Dragonfire, which is cool. I feel like I gotta, I kind of gotta pick this up. Although I have to admit, I, I wonder. I mean, Jen, I we already have our characters. We want to keep playing the characters we have. Uh, this is just an opportunity to start more different, varied characters. Well, well, who am I kidding? I gotta, I gotta pick this up because we do. In spite of my misgivings about uh, Dragonfire, still enjoy it quite a bit. And so, you know, more, more is always a good thing, right? Um, let's talk now about High Rise. 
Now, this is from designer Gil Hova, who a couple of years ago had just a... He just knocked it out of the park with a fantastic card game known as The Networks. And since then, he's released a couple of expansions for it. I haven't actually gotten to try either of those. I'm looking forward to them. And he's done some other games here and there, too. Uh, Wordsy and some stuff. But it seems like High Rise is going to be his next big new thing. And... Just the incredible high quality, the high bar that the network sets is what pulls me into this and makes me want to see more. Apparently, it's a city building game where you're laying tiles, but um, it also features a Glenn Moore style time track where the bigger move you make, that means your opponents get can make lots of little tiny moves before you get to go again. Time tracks can work brilliantly well. I almost always enjoy them when I see them. I like building cities, and I like Gil Hova. So High Rise, that's three for three in my book, so I'm looking forward to trying it. But, oh man, folks. Of all the things I'm about to talk about, I think the number one most anticipated amongst them would be Twa 2. <laughs> the sequel, completely coming out of the blue, nobody expected this, to another one of my top ten games of all time, Twa. Oh my gosh. Here's what's really interesting about it. Not only is it called Twa 2 because it's the sequel um, in the Twa series of games, it's also a two-player only game, which is mind-blowing. Um, I, I wouldn't have expected that. It looks like, uh, you know, there's not that much information. It looks like it's um, a dice-heavy game. Now, of course, Twa featured dice too, but it really wasn't about the dice. I expect this Twa 2... Well, we'll probably put a higher emphasis on using dice, although I'm not really quite sure. I have no idea what they're going to do, but I don't care. Twa is so amazing. Uh, the gang is back, coming up with a new and interesting take on it. Cannot wait to see Twa 2. And hey, here's another expansion. Role player. Friends and Familiars. I should have mentioned that back up with Role Player Adventures. Um, this, of course, will be an expansion for just regular role player to um, add. Oh, yeah. Or I'm sorry, not Friends and uh, Familiars. Fiends and Familiars. And uh, you know, more role player is good. Although you know, I say that. I personally wasn't as big a fan of the first role player as I would have thought because I wasn't that keen on how they introduced combat, but still, I loved all the new equipment and items that got put into the game, and one of the new types of things that's going to be in this expansion is familiars that you can draft to get pets and stuff like that. So that's going to be awesome in and of itself. And so yeah, that's again another no-brainer just because role player is so amazing. Plus, hey, the more options you have for building a character in role player, the cooler it's going to get to play role player adventure, right? Oh my gosh, I'm just so excited. Ah, this is an inciting month, folks. So many really cool things. I guess that's not surprising because, you know, we're over the hump. We're halfway through, and now we're starting to hear about all the goodness that's going to be coming at Gen Con, and some of the goodness is going to be coming at Essen Spiel. So, no surprise, there's a lot of really cool things to talk about, like... The Tale of Ord. Now, this is interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard of Loot Crate and the dozens of other offshoots. Basically, these subscription services where every month they will send you a box full of stuff. And you never know exactly what's going to be in there. And, you know, there's all kinds of different crates that send different types of things every month. I think... That's kind of what Tale of Ord is, a subscription service where they send you out new stuff. But this is kind of an escape room that is going to be played out episodically, chapter after chapter, month after month, where every month they send you a new packet of more things to deal with, more puzzles to solve as this big epic narrative uh, you know, unfolds right before our very eyes. That is very, very cool. A monthly game subscription, or kind of game slash puzzle narrative experience subscription. That sounds super cool. So I am super duper interested in Tale of Ord. And let's see, moving on, we've got... Oh, this is nice. I didn't expect this, because Legend of Andor turns out is a trilogy. The third in the trilogy has come out now, and I figured, hey, you know, the sun is going to be setting for Andor, but The Legends of Andor, The Lost Legends, was recently announced. 
It creates three new standalone adventures that are played with the original Andor. Not Journey to the North, um, not, what is it called, Last Hope, I think is, is the third one. And I gotta say, I'm very, very excited about that because while I have enjoyed the other two Andors, um, the original Legend of Andor is still the best of the series. So, going back and revisiting that with some entirely new adventures, entirely new uses for that board, I'm sure new monsters and new bosses and new fiendishly clever puzzly gameplay cannot wait. Now, right now it's only been announced for German players, as is always the case, but my fingers are crossed uh, that uh, English speakers will get to play Legends of Andor the Lost Legends sometime in the near future as well. Um, also, uh, speaking of more continuations, we've got the next series of games in the Exit the Game series. Oh, I just, I totally, <laughs> that was a ridiculous way to put it. But anyway, uh, three new games. What are they called? Uh, Catacomb of Horror. And let's see, where did the other ones go? The Catacomb of Horror, the Mysterious Museum, and the Sinister Mansion. Three more coming. And... What's really interesting about these is, you know, all of the Exit Games, Exit the Game titles have been developed by Inca and Marcus Brand. You know, the 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 brands, uh, one of the most prolific design duos, a husband and wife team, and they've all been brilliant. And that's the thing. Every time I play a new set, I am continually surprised how the brands keep coming up with new and interesting twists to the, the formula of Exit the Game. And I've asked in the past, how long can they keep coming up with it? Well, the interesting thing about these next three games, for the first time, the brands are getting a co-designer, a, a design partner, uh, Ralph uh, uh, Querfirth, who has worked with them in the past on some of their other games. They brought him in. And that, I think, could be very, very cool that they are kind of expanding their horizons. What will a new, what will new fresh blood bring to the overall system? I don't know. Be, I, you know, but I'm excited to find out. So looking forward to the next three games in the Exit the Game series. Then we've got uh, Mesozoic. Um, as in, me, me, you know, uh, Mesozoic, but it's Mesozoic. And it's a card drafting game. Which is is nice. Card drafting is 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 lovely. But the interesting thing is, the cards you're drafting are towards building a uh, sliding puzzle on the table. You know those puzzles where you've got like a four by four grid and one of the pieces is missing, and so you start sliding things around. I love the idea of meshing that with card drafting. I don't know how that works, but it is interesting. Also interesting, this is a real-time game, a real-time card drafting game with a sliding puzzle at the center of it. I, that blows my mind. I am a huge fan of Survivor, the TV series. Both Jen and I are. And you know, if you're a fan of Survivor, you know several times generally over the course of a season, there will be those incredibly tense real-time puzzles, the sliding puzzles that the contestants have to solve while they're out there starving to death and sunburned and all that. Um, so, I don't know. Will, will this give a slight feeling of that or a real-time competitive slide puzzle game? I, I don't know. Here's the... I, I don't know enough to say if I'm really interested in this game, except for the fact that it is from the designer of Apocalypse Chaos. And now, I did a run-through for that. Apocalypse Chaos was an absolutely brilliant, cooperative, uh, science fiction uh, tower defense game. Literally a tower. You build a 3D tower on the board and try to protect multiple levels. Absolutely stellar, wonderful, puzzly game. Loved it to pieces. Uh, what was the designer? Florian Fay. And uh, you know, it broke my heart that it did not you know catch fire. But the design of Apocalypse Chaos was so strong. That's why I'm interested in Mesozoic. And never mind the fact that it's got all these cool elements that have, I've never seen brought together. So I, I'm keen on that. But more importantly, um, uh, Florian. He's a designer to watch because Apocalypse Chaos was just the bee's knees. But now let's move on to New Frontiers. And now this is funky. Uh, this is basically a this is basically the latest game in the Race for the Galaxy 
series. Uh, you know, you got Race for the Galaxy with a bunch of different expansions. You've got Roll for the Galaxy. Now you, and then you've got Jumpgate. And um, you know, Tom Lehman, he is not done with his intergalactic baby. He has now created New Frontiers, which I guess borrows a lot of the core gameplay of Race for the Galaxy. But from what I've read, the single biggest new addition is it's not a case where every round everybody chooses simultaneously what they want to do and then reveal. Instead, players have a traditional turn structure. And that's a simple little change. And I don't know, there's probably other changes as well. I read somewhere that maybe there's a board added now. I'm not sure. But just that one change, that we're no longer simultaneous action selecting, but taking turns, that's huge. That could be incredibly consequential. And considering how good everything that has come before or I, I've never actually made, I've never played any of the Race for Galaxy expansions, but the base game is so good. Jumpgate is so good. Roll for the Galaxy is so good, which Tom was a co designer on. I expect New Frontiers to be equally amazing. So, looking forward to that. Then we've got Roll for Adventure. Now, this is from the design duo that brought us Elysium, which the year it came out, it made my top 10 as an absolutely, amazingly bonkers good um, card drafting game. And so, I mean, when, when when these guys get together to put something else out, I'm immediately interested. I don't know much about what Roll for Adventure has. It's a fantasy cooperative dice rolling game. Okay, that's all I needed. Uh, let's check it out when it becomes available. Roll for Adventure. Then, oh, f- folks, almost done. Just two more games. Snowdonia the Deluxe Edition. This is on Kickstarter right now. Snowdonia, uh, longtime fans of the show know, you know, it made my top 10 worker placement games of all time. And if I were doing that top 10 list today, I'm sure Snowdonia would still make that top 10. It is an amazing game that um, the designer publisher has been putting out content for steadily for years now. Um, you know, I, there's so much Snowdonia content out there, it's impossible for anybody to get their hands on all of it. But now, I guess it's all being collected into one big super big box edition. Uh, it looks like a very big box, uh, including beautiful upgraded uh, deluxe components. This is a no-brainer, folks. Uh, Snowdonia is absolutely amazing. This is giving it the incredible makeover Uber collection it has always deserved. And so, like I said, it's on Kickstarter right now. Definitely something worth checking out, the Snowdonia Deluxe Edition. And the last game I've got to tell you, did I, did I, uh, folks, this, this is an incredible, I mean, this is a year's worth of games that are so amazing. I know I said earlier, Twa 2 is probably my number one most anticipated of everything, but I forgot. I just added a new one last night onto this list called Sleeping Gods. This might be my new number one uh, most anticipated of all these things I'm talking about here because it's from writer, er, designer artist Ryan Lockett. Ryan Lockett is back! He's bringing us another game in his Lockett verse. Those are always amazing. This is another big, epic, story-driven, campaign-style game, like Near and Far. Uh, it also, you know, so it, it has a big book full of story snippets you get to read that tell big, epic, interwoven uh, the narratives that you take your characters through. It also has a big book of maps you travel through, again, like near and far. I don't know what the new gameplay is. I don't care. This is a sight unseen, must-have game. I do know one bit, though. It mentions it in the description on Board Game Geek. I absolutely love this idea. The book of individual maps that represent all the locations in this world it is functionally one contiguous map because if you're on a given, you know, two-page fold-out spread and exploring and traveling and adventuring and whatever it is you're going to do in this game and you go all the way to the right side and go off the edge of the map, you turn the page and go to the next map. So functionally, you can imagine this board being one big, gigantic, long, super skinny board that would probably go from one end of your house to the other if you laid it all out. But instead, it's delivered to you in book form. Maybe that's not that big a deal, but man, that really tickles my fancy. Uh, Exploring this world is one big, contiguous, super, uber, gigantic space. Um, I love it. Uh, you know, it kind of feels like, I, I, again, I don't know if it feels this way, 
but it immediately engenders in my head old, uh, you know, video game adventure style stuff. You know, your old Legends of Zeldas and, um, you know, Final Fantasies and stuff like that, where you just have this huge world to explore, Metroids and all that kind of thing. Again, I have no idea what the gameplay is like because I don't care. Ryan Lockett has proven himself time and time again, so I have nothing but the utmost confidence that Sleeping Gods will be absolutely amazing when it goes on Kickstarter later this year. Ryan, talk to me. Send me a prototype. I want to run through this thing. Anyway, that's it, folks. Those were some new, very, very exciting games of interest. And uh, now, if you'd like to hold on, we'll be right back and talk about some top 10 topics. Okay, everybody, now it's time to do some top tens. I've got two to go over, and, oh man, these are both fairly big topics. Let's hit them one at a time. First of all, we'll talk about my part two of my top ten boards of all time, where I talked about form rather than function. And then we'll revisit my top ten roll and rights with an upset. There's going to be a late arrival based on games I've recently played. But first of all, the boards. So, like I said in the actual top 10, I was really focusing there not only on boards that I found aesthetically pleasing, but that I also found very clever in the way that they presented their aesthetics and how their aesthetics impacted the gameplay. So, with that in mind, I was able... I mean, it was really the only way I could narrow down and come up with a top 10 favorite boards in terms of their looks. But oh my god, there are so many gorgeous boards for other reasons that are less about how they impact gameplay and more just about, I guess, how their art speaks to me. So let me just go through just a few of them. I mean, I could do this all day long, but I gotta watch my throat, folks. So, right off the bat, and this is kind of in alphabetical order, I think. Yeah, I think this is gonna be in alphabetical order. So let's start with A for Alien Frontiers. While the game itself isn't for me and Jen, because, oh my gosh, it's just so cutthroat and so long, so needlessly long, um, it doesn't change the fact that I love the board with its retro 50s, 60s pulp fiction, science fiction type cover. And now I love the extra attention to detail of naming all the different areas of the planet after famous science fiction authors. And, and, you know, the whole thing comes together beautifully in large part because I love it when a board's aesthetics directly serve the function of the board. Um, you know, the the way that, oh, you know, this is where the pirates are uh, if, if you're activating because, oh, look, there's the pirates are on the board in this section. You know, it's, it's a worker placement game. And rather than just abstracting the locations that you place your workers or dice in the case of Alien Frontiers, they really ground those spaces by, oh, I put the dice on these different space stations and whatnot. It's a beautiful package. Absolutely love it. And, you know, a lot of people ask me about Anachrony. Since I put Tracurion on, what about Anachrony? Make no mistake, it is a striking board. Absolutely stunning. But it didn't make the list, whereas Tracurion did, in large part because it's a shame that I think too much of the board art is covered up by the iconography and the the cards and stuff you put on top of the board. I, I think they went a little bit overboard and you lose a big sense of that crazy apocalyptic world that you, that Zardoz style place that you find yourself in. So yeah, that's why I didn't make the list. Archon... And if I were to jump ahead to Carez, uh, those are two boards that I just love to pieces. From a lesser known or a very little known artist in the industry, um, Antonis, oh gosh, Antonis, uh, uh, Papantonio, I think? He's a Greek artist, I assume. And, you know, he's done a lot of games. But both, of the, you know, Fallen City of Carez and Archon, uh, Glory and Mastination, if I recall correctly, is the full title. I really love those two boards. They're so deep and intricate. There's just something about uh, Antonis's presentation on them that absolutely just floors me. And I, I could just, again, it's an example where I could just look at them for endless amounts of time and lose myself in them. They're so gorgeous. And speaking of gorgeous, it's not out yet, but the upcoming brass reprints, oh my God, those boards look so 
opulent. I can't think of a better word. So stunning and and gorgeous and rich and deep and opulent. They look. I haven't seen them in real life, but if they if they come across at all like the production images I've seen, the, oh my gosh, those are just going to be absolutely amaze balls. You know, another one I thought about putting on the list is um, Catacombs, the second edition with the art by Quan Chai Moria. Uh, Quan Chai Moria. He might make into my top 10 artists of all time because he's got such a unique style. And his style is interesting because, you know, it's kind of counter to a lot of what I've really enjoyed. The Michael Menzel's and, you know, um, know, Antonis' work that is really dense and just chock-a-block full of detail. Quan Chai's work, especially in Catacombs, is almost kind of like abstract art. It's just a collection of shapes and colors that kind of comes together to, you know, sell the idea of where you are. And, I mean, all the different boards that come with Catacombs, and, you know, there's been several expansions now, and the the spinoff games, you know, again, they're just big, gigantic splashes of color that you could almost imagine seeing hanging on a an, on a museum wall, you know, for modern kind of abstract art. I absolutely love them, though. Although a big part of why I love them too is because uh, Catacombs then, those beautiful locations are covered up by all those little discs that you're going to flip that are covered with his absolutely gorgeous character art. I mean, I really predominantly love Quan Chai as a character artist. Uh, his environments are great too, don't get me wrong, but his characters really shine. And again, when you set up Catacombs, you've got this gorgeous board surrounded by tons of his card art of representing all his different characters. And then those characters are on the board too. Has an overall absolutely wonderful presence I just adore. CO2, the first edition, is another just gobsmackingly gorgeous game. Um, you know, this kind of almost somber, almost sad pastel look that it's got that is trying to make something beautiful while at the same time trying to represent something that is truly awful. You know, the encroaching and spreading destruction of that's caused by global warming. Um, you know, it's a really interesting artistic piece. And it's, it's also interesting that I think the upcoming reprint, while there's so many really cool things about the reprint, I think I like the more sedate and subdued original CO2. Now, I get it. You know, CO2, the second edition, is trying to represent that things have gotten even worse, even hotter. So it's much more blown out and saturated. But, um, you know, the, the original CO2, I've definitely had to make my, you know, nom- my nominations, my uh, special mentions. Esteril 1942... I really like how that comes together as well. Uh, the Miko is another one of my probably top 10 favorite artists. And while I mostly love his character work, like Quan Chai, I mean, his characters are just so characterful. I, I mean, they're just so alive. And, uh, you know, I have such an incredible sense of humor to them in the way they're designed. I absolutely love them. And it's kind of easy to, you know, lose his his environmental work as well. But Esteril, 1942, and also Raiders of the North Sea, and actually all of the Raiders games, really do a wonderful job of showing he's more than just a pretty face. Uh, you know, His boards are absolutely stellar as well. Another one that I thought about mentioning on the list, I couldn't do it in good conscience because it's so simple, but man, I just love the visual impact of Fjords. Once you're done playing and you've got this little tiny microsphere of a landscape that you've built and covered up with basically discs and little simple houses, I don't know, there's just something about it. It's just so sweet and charming and pure and just gorgeous. Um... You know, I mean, I guess by that token, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I want to like give credit to Carcassonne because it does kind of the same thing, but it doesn't do it for my aesthetic taste near as well as Fjords does. Absolutely lovely. Also, another board that I seriously considered because of its whole how its form can enhance its function. Man, I am tickled pink by Heroes Wanted. I love all those boards. You know, a big part of that is the graphic design. The boards are designed to look like a newspaper where, you know, the front page story is just bursting off the board and it's actually showing the location that your crazy misfit superheroes are going to run around. I mean, again, a great sense of humor to them, but a really wonderful grounding of, you know, the way that they are designed visually to help reinforce the overall theme of the game. 
Because, hey, it's Heroes Wanted. Like, the whole thing is you're looking through the classifieds of, you know, the, the, the want ads of a newspaper. Why not have the board look like the front page of a newspaper? Which you wouldn't expect for a superhero game, but it, it works so well. So really, really cool. A Heroes Wanted. And, you know, in the top ten, I mentioned there are just so many games that are just drop-dead stunningly gorgeous. And, there's, and that's all there is to say. The art is just absolutely amazing. And you know, there's a lot of them I could talk about. Surprisingly, a lot of them seem to come from French publishers or developers. I don't know if Histrio is, but it sure feels like it. It feels like one of those beautiful, gorgeous French art games. And it is. It's absolutely stunning. Now, a big part of that is because it's got really cool miniatures and all that, and that really awesome stage that uh, is such overkill. It's uh, but but it's it's it, it doesn't change the fact that the you know the the board that is predominantly really just a bunch of cards that are laid out looks absolutely stellar too. Another game I would have happily mentioned is Jam Sumo, which is not a pretty game at all. But that's because the board is basically just a handcrafted block of wood. And, you know, I mean, I when I hold it in my hands, it just feels so good knowing that the developer designer actually made this thing you know, in his wood shop by hand. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, it is a very nicely put together block of wood. It has a lovely, spare, and elegant aesthetic to it, but it just feels so good to hold it, knowing it was crafted by hand. I, I just and absolutely um, just find it so endearing, my Jam Sumo board. And, um, you know, in the top 10, I talked at great length <clears throat> about. There's just something about the aesthetics of Clans of Caledonia, even though it's such a simple, kind of bog-standard approach to board game visual design. I could say the same thing, and I almost called out in the top 10, Kingdom Builder. That is another game that just looks just wonderful to me. It just tickles my fancy. I mean, in large part because of the way it, it slots together, you know, it's kind of jigsaw puzzly nature. And, you know, as it fills up and it's just completely overflowing with all these little colorful houses that players spread all over the place. I, I, I just think it's just, it's just lovely, lovely looking game. And man, I can't not give a huge shout out. If you're just talking about pure aesthetics, I've got to call out the uh, Reiner Knizia's original Lord of the Rings board game. Because what is the board there? It's just big, absolutely stunning poster art of John Howe's Lord of the Rings art. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that Moria board is just amazing. I mean, they're, you know, just in terms of pure aesthetics, so beautiful. Because John Howe is an absolutely, you know, there's a reason he is the number one, you know, Tolkien artist. I, I, he's still working today, isn't he? I, I know he had a big influence. He did a lot of the, of the, uh, art design for the feature films as well. And anyway, the Lord of the Rings, the board game, the original cooperative board game from Reiner Knizia, definitely makes my top 10 most wonderfully aesthetic just because it's such a wonderful showcase for his art. And um, let's see, oh, Mechs versus Minions. Several people ask me, what about Mechs versus Minions? Surely that's one of the top 10 boards. And it's a gorgeous board. And oh my gosh, the production on it where those oil slicks are actually slick, you know, because they put that extra translate. I mean, absolutely stellar. No toys about it. But, you know, they don't make the list because they don't really change anything about the gameplay just because they look really amazing. But there's no denying. They do look really amazing. Mech versus Minion. Everything about that production is second to none. Um. Oh, uh, you know, my number one in the list was, what do you call it? A Runebound, third edition. And I got to say, you know, Fantasy Flight, they know how to make a good looking board these days. And I wonder if it really started with Middle Earth Quest, because man, that is a tour de force. I mean, to a certain extent, a lot of what I said about Runebound third edition is there in spades with Middle Earth Quest as well, you know, making Middle Earth come alive, making you feel like the board is so huge. I mean, it's two it's two full size boards that you you know you you butt up next to each other, so it destroys your table. But man, that has such a huge, powerful visual impact. I mean, I absolutely love it. And then, oh, I thought long and hard about Miramis. I really love that. Um, you know, you know the way it 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 works the hexagonal. I guess hexes aren't a grid, but you know what I mean. You know the hexagonal layout of the uh, of the of your own backyard. Um, but you know it kind of tells the story from the perspective of the ants. 
if that makes sense. And, uh, you know, the, the way it, it, it melds in the above and the below ground, everything about it is absolutely charming, too. Nauticus... I think I mentioned in the video, you know, that old trick of melding orange and blue. Nauticus, oh, it does that beautifully. Um, you know, there's no particular reason it should stand out for me so much, but it does. I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. And let's see here. Oh, then what have we got? Oh, Stronghold. Yeah, I should definitely talk about that. Both the original and the second edition, I think that both of those maps are great. And they are wonderful examples of what I was talking about in the video, uh, boards where the aesthetics inform and enhance the actual gameplay through their graphic design and all that. Be they both work beautifully. Whether you like the more grim and gritty new version that feels like, you know, the Battle of Helm's Deep, or the bright, colorful original one that feels like kind of a fairy tale, Fantasy Kingdom, they're both absolutely wonderful. And the way that they can simplify and streamline what is a very complex game and really help you through the simulation is, is fantastic. T-Call 2. Oh uh, man, that I kept going back and forth, back and forth between, um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, let's see. Which one was it? Oh, um, Right, right, right. Lewis and Clark and uh, Vincent Dutre's other visual masterpiece, T Call 2. I love them both. Ultimately, I gave the nod to uh, Lewis and Clark, but T Call 2 is absolutely lovely as well. The way they meld these different gameplay elements the interior and exterior of the pyramid you're exploring, the river that wraps around all of it, and the places where you go off, you know, um, you, you, you take your raft uh, oh, out of the river. Why do I want to cut? Yo, you take it overland. Um, everything about that is absolutely stunning. And then on top of that, it's accentuated by absolutely amazing components. No wooden cubes here. Let's actually make real modeled cubes of, of you know plastic cubes that represent the cargo and container crates. The regular cubes could have done. It's it's such a wonderful, opulent, um, overblown production. But at the heart of it is Vincent Dutre's absolutely lovely environment. Twa. Oh my gosh, I love this art. And I know a lot of people hate it uh, you know, because it's going for this kind of faux medieval era art style. But considering, I mean, I, I, can, I love how it brings that period of history to life and, and tries to present it in the way that the artists of that time would present it. Uh, instead of making it look like a beautiful, gorgeous, modern Menzel uh, you know, masterwork board. I, I think it's great. I love everything about Twa and the way it presents its world and its characters. Yamatai, on the other hand, is just another riotous, beautiful explosion of color that I just love the look of. Even though we didn't like the game necessarily, man, that board is great. As is Yido. Y-E-D-O. Oh, man. Basically, Lords of Waterdeep set in uh, feudal era Japan. Uh, again, just an explosion of color and detail. Everything I love about a board, it's just so gorgeous. And you know what? One more thing I wanted to mention. I made another list. Hey, everybody, here's a bonus top 10. Because I think in the original top 10, I mentioned how, when I was talking about how I wasn't going to do more than one board from any given artist. And um, But if I wanted, I could have easily made a top 10 just out of Michael Menzel's. Hey, here's my Michael Menzel Top 10 Countdown. At number 10, we've got Thebes. Number 9 is Bruges. 8 is Agra. 7 is World Without End. 6, Royal Palace. 5, Pillars of the Earth. 4, A Castle for All Seasons. 3, Andor. And I'm putting all three Andors because they're all gorgeous, all in one. Um, otherwise, I'd have to kick out uh, Agra, Bruges, and Thebes, which would be a shame. So Andor at number 3, Stone Age at number 2, and Column of Fire at number 1. All of those boards... Oh, man... And now I'm looking at it. Wait a minute. Where's Santiago? Oh my gosh. I, to, I ah. All right. Maybe that pushes Thebes out. I don't know. But man, I really love Thebes. Anyway, though, that's just a quick, almost off the cuff, not necessarily ready for prime time top 10 of Michael Menzel. But anyway, folks, that's it. I am done, I think, talking about board game art for a long, long time. But if you hold on, I'll come right back and talk a bit more about Roland Rights right after this.
Okay, now it's time to revisit those rolling rights, which turned out to be a very popular topic. Not surprising, considering that there's such a huge explosion in popularity for this genre of game, where you first generate some kind of random element, and then two, write it down on a piece of paper. It's an idea as old as time in the board game industry, going back to Yahtzee, and like I said, it's catching on fire. So, there's several things to talk about here that I didn't go over in my top 10. The first being uh, so many people asking about Gone Shown Clever and Welcome To. Two games that are exploding in popularity right now. I mean, they're super duper hot. Um, although Gone Shown Clever is only available in German, although you can order it internationally and uh, there are English translations available on Board Game Geek and all that. Now, here's the deal at the time of my filming, I had played neither of these. Since then, I have played both of these. And in fact, at the end of the month, uh, you'll be able to see a rundown. I filmed a rundown for both of them. Although if you don't want to wait till the end of the month, as always, you can head over to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash rotto, and uh, back me at the runner level, which means you get to see my rundowns as I film them, rather than waiting till the end of the month for them all to show up. Anyway, sorry, a uh, little bit of an advertisement for myself right there. Long story short, I played both Gone Shun Clever and Welcome To Now. Gone Shun Clever would not make my top 10. Really, for the exact same reasons I said in the run-through. I was playing it, I was thinking, wow, this is really clever, I can see why it got the Kenner Spiel nomination. It's a little bit more heft to it than your average roll and write. There's a lot here to like. I'm very, very impressed by the design. And, oh my god, I'm falling asleep. I'm sorry, folks. If it's abstract, I just can't be bothered to be interested. It's just, I need something to pull me in. And playing all the way through the game and then saying, look at how well I did it, blue! And oh, I really ignored my orange is just so antithetical to enjoyment for me. Uh, it just felt so rote and by the book. And all it takes is just a little bit of theme. I mean, as I was playing it, I was wishing, why isn't this Trajan? The dice game or something. Just because you've got all these different tracks you're working on, much like Trajan, and you focus on one at the expense of the other, and they all represent different things. Oh, this represents my um, mastery of the Senate. This represents my contribution to Rome's wars abroad. This represents to my public works to the people. And then... At the end of the game, I'd be able to say, well, look, I really donated to the people. And, oh my god, I didn't build any houses after the Great Fire at all. Oh my gosh, you single-handedly rebuilt the city. I need something like that. I need the game to tell me some kind of story. Because I just can't get excited about being the master of blue and a Jen is the master of purple. It's such a shame. It would be so easy to lay in dozens of different themes into that system and make it truly come alive. Fair enough, the designer didn't want to. Hey, you know what? There's a little mini renaissance of abstract games going on right now. So more power to them. But yeah, Gone Shown Clever cannot make my list because I just found it to be a snooze fest in spite of the fact that its design was so great. Now, Welcome To, on the other hand. Well, folks, I've only played it a couple times so far, but there's no doubt that pushes its way into my top 10, easily knocking my um, Expedition Sumatra slash Los Incognitos out of the top 10 to make room for Welcome To. I need to play it some more to find out where it would rank, but oh my gosh, this is great. It is, first of all, it's not exactly a roll and write. It's a draw card and write, but Close enough. You randomly generate some kind of value you have to work with, and then you write them down to decide how to work with them. And, it, and it's great. The insane amount of tension, the really uh, clever variety of plays, and the fact that it's got a really nice introductory version and a heavier, more advanced version of play uh, that gives you a lot more control. You're a lot less at the uh, you know suffering at the whim of random chance. Uh, this game's got it all. And a great thematic presentation. Building a suburb. The numbers are the addresses on the buildings. Uh, because they are the addresses on the buildings, you can't have more than one number on a given row. 
That is a near perfect textbook example of how theme can enhance the experience by helping to support what are otherwise just completely esoteric, meaningless rules that are just there just because. Now they're not there just because. They're there because the theme demands it, and it makes it come alive. So welcome to Does Push Into the List, Gan Shun Clever Does Not. But anyway, so I had to address those. Now, there are so many more roll and rights out there I could talk about, and people kept saying, what about, what about, what about? Sorry, folks. Quinto, Quix, Nochmal, and Dice Stars, they're all abstract. See what I just said a second ago? I am never even going to give these the time of day. After Gone Shown Clever fell so flat for me, I, it's just not worth my time when I've got so many other games to play. Um, now, there were plenty of other games I could have mentioned, and none of these made the list. Penny Papers, Roll to the Top, Zularetto the Dice Game, Doodle City, Harvest Dice, and Rolling America slash Rolling Japan. They're all good games, although actually that's not true. Penny Papers is such a huge, monumental disappointment. A really nice, solid system. Three great takes on you know the core idea. All three games absolutely ruined by gratuitous, useless, terrible, just one of the worst design decisions I've seen in years. The take-that-attack nature of those games absolutely ruined it. Penny Papers could have been a contender. It could have made my top 10 if they hadn't so if they hadn't literally shot themselves in the foot. It's such a huge egregious misstep that um it makes me mad. And you know folks, I I know a lot of people are saying, "Well, yeah, that's just Rado though. He's a care bear. He can't handle a little of the old fisticuffs." I was interested to see since I did my original rundown and um, of Penny Papers, I did it quite a while ago. I saw on the Dice Tower, Z Garcia and Tom Vassell both did videos for the Penny Papers, and they both agreed with me that the take that attack nature of the games ruins them. It just it shouldn't be there. It turns what could otherwise be a nice series of games into blech. So oh my gosh, so depressing, Penny Papers. But anyway, um. Roll to the top. I actually like quite a bit. I had a fun time playing it. It was on Kickstarter, but it can't make my top 10 because, again, it's pretty abstract. It's less abstract than Nochmal or, or Gone Shun Clever, but it's still a bit too abstract to make my top 10. Zularetto Dice Game is nice, but it's like Zularetto itself. It needs more than two players to be at its best. Uh, it's just the way it is because of its interesting drafting uh, mechanism. But it works. Don't get me wrong. It, it's okay. We liked it, but just needs more than two to be at its best. Doodle City surprised me, because I so loved Avenue. And basically, Doodle City is the prequel, dice-based version of Avenue. But Avenue is just so much better. So, so, so much better. I, I just couldn't bring myself to hold on to Doodle City. Harvest Dice. I did a rundown for it recently. It's it's nice, but it's just too light for us. And Rolling Japan, Rolling America, also very nice. But you know what? I would rather play Welcome to any day of the week. Um, again, because of its more thematic grounding. Now, so those are some other Roll and Rights I, that just didn't make my list even though I played them. There are so many Roll and Rights I have not played. Here's a list of, what is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, I believe, games that I suspect all have the potential to make my top 10. I just haven't played them. Most of them aren't even available yet or are only available in Japan and haven't made it over, you know, into the broader world. Several of them haven't been published at all. Some of them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But all of these are interesting prime contenders. Since I haven't played them, I'm not really going to spend any time. I'm just going to list them. You can go on Board Game Geek and look them up yourself. They are Alpenzian... Ancient Artifacts, Dice and Dragons, Doodle Islands, Fleet the Dice Game. Very excited about that one. Let's Make a Bus Route. I think Z Garcia did a video for this recently on the Dice Tower. Uh, Metro X, Railroad Inc., Roland Wright with a W. I just got to say, I, I, I just love that for the title. Uh, you know, And again, it's clearly going to be a thematic thing if you're following the adventures of Mr. Roland Wright. Uh, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, Sunflower Valley, Viva Java the Dice Game. Now, that one, to be fair, that's been around for quite a while. I've just never gotten a chance to play it, but I really want to try it. And uh, Verfaland. 
those could all potentially make my original top 10. I just don't know because I haven't played them. Let's see. And then the other thing I want to talk about related to uh, Roland Rights was, I, you know what? I guess I kind of knew that there is this kind of big explosion of print and play games. It's kind of this whole genre in the industry that most of us don't know about. If you go on Board Game Geek, there are so many geek lists of uh, named things like uh, print and plays that are better than retail games or print and plays I'm waiting to print and play. Basically, you go on to Board Game Geek, you download these files, PDFs, Word files, whatever it might be, you print them out, and then you play them. You get them totally for free. There are literally thousands of these. And as I understand it, there are hundreds of them that are excellent, wonderful, fantastic games. But now here's what's so brilliant about Roll and Write. A lot of these print and plays, it's going to be a real pain to not only print out a board and somehow make it, but you know, create all the components, the pieces, this and that and the other. Too much work. I mean, hey, we got lives. You don't have time for that. But a roll and write print and play, just print out a page of paper, grab some dice and a pencil, and start playing. So there is a huge um, cottage industry, or it's not. I mean, I because I, I think in large part because there's these yearly print and play contests that are happening all over the place. I didn't even know they existed, but where people are just um, you know designing little games, uh, posting them, getting feedback, entering them into the contest, getting them played, and there's all these different uh, winners. Some of them go on to become commercial games. Some of them just languish, languish in obscurity forever. And so I just want to give a little bit of time to them because a lot of love and attention. Some of these things look absolutely gorgeous. The art in them is as good as anything you would see in a commercial game. And from what I've read, I should say I have not played any of these. But from what I've read, uh, both from the excitement and enthusiasm people have for them, and from just looking at the actual art that's associated with them, I suspect these could all be potential games that would push their way into my top 10 as well. If I could be bothered to take the time to go out and buy a printer and then print them and play them. Now, this first list, and by the way, these lists are just in alphabetical order. Since I haven't played them, I can't really rate them. This first list is interesting in that they are all solo only. This is another thing that really surprised me. A an explosion of solo only um, print and play roll and writes with a wide variety of topics. A lot of them, seems like there's a repeating motif of them being dungeon crawls. Basically, you you, you print out a dungeon and then you roll and write your way through it. I love that idea. Uh, and again, some of these look so good. Some of them are really deep, really complex. Um, but I haven't tried them. But anyway, and you know, not all of them are adventures. There's other stuff too. What are they? Well, of all the ones I saw, and I'm just scratching the surface here, but these are the ones that really jumped out at me as interesting. 1572 Lost Expedition. Ada Lovelace, consulting mathematician. I mean, come on. That sounds... Just that subject matter sounds absolutely amazing. D100 Dungeon. Deep Deep Dungeon. Doom Realm. Escape the Dead. Harbinger Project. Magic Realm Light 30. And Utopia Engine. Honestly, if you go look up any of those on Board Game Geek and just print them out, I don't think you could go wrong. They all look fantastic if you're looking for a fun little solo experience. I'm not, so I'm not... Although, gosh, Ada Lovelace Consulting Mathematician? Doesn't that just make you want to know more just from the title? Anyway, though, here's another list. And now these officially support more than one player. So I'm even more interested in them. Again, in alphabetical order. 30 Rails, Reiner Knizia's Decathlon, Holmes and Watson, Adventures in the London Fog, Pencils and Powers, and the last one, Welcome to Dino World, this one actually shouldn't be on the list, because just now, right before I was going to film, I mean, I, I made this list a month ago, back when I did the original Top 10. I think it's over a month now. And um, I forgot about it, and I was going back and looking at these things again today, just to make sure I still agreed with what I thought, um, whatever, six weeks ago. And I discovered... Welcome to Dino World, that last one, has been picked up for official publication. It's going to go on Kickstarter later this year. So congratulations. I mean, apparently this print and play 
Dice, uh, roll and write is a path to potentially getting your game published. And again, all of these games I just listed, they all look fantastic. They all look like they could stand toe to toe with the best of the roll and writes that are already on the market. It all looks like they could potentially make my top 10. So anyway, there's a little bit of research you can do yourself. Go on Board Game Geek. If any of those sounded interesting, look them up. If you look up any one of these things at the bottom of the page, you'll see um, there's an entry, an entry called Geek Lists. And that's basically where players, or not players, viewers of Board Game Geek make their own lists of games. Just go check out some geek lists. You will start finding tons and tons of these things. And, uh, oh man, there is such a brave new world out there. It, again, it makes perfect sense. A roll and write is so bare, it's, it's so to the metal. It's a piece of paper, some dice, and a pencil. Anybody can design one. Anybody can make one. So... Uh, it, it's 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 very very exciting. It's very cool. I really enjoyed um, researching all these games. Even if I'm not playing them, I had a fun time looking them up, learning what they were all about, and dreaming of a day when I might play some of them. And that's it, folks. I am now done. I am spent. My throat is gone. We are done with top ten roll and rights. And if you hold on, I'll be back with Jen for the monthly questions and answers. <laughs> Okay, everybody, questions and answers time. And as always, I am joined by Jen. Hi, honey pie. Hello. Okay, let's get to the game stuff ASAP and get to the personal stuff later. Dylan, honey pie. Is that late sat? Late sat, ASAP, what have you. Dylan would like us to do a recap of the UK Games Expo. Ooh. Highlights, best personal moments, surprises, all the good stuff. Well, I was impressed with the organization. I felt like the organize organizers really cared about the vendors and that we were um, able to get what we needed when we needed it, get in and out, and that sort of thing. So I was really impressed with the organization of it. Really? I was feeling the exact opposite of that. While I thought it was a very good convention, I found nothing but pain and hardship thanks to the behind-the-scenes organization of the convention. Well, I think you had hardship based on Birmingham's uh, the actual convention center issues where I'm saying that the actual organizer issues were very well sorted. That could very well be, but at the end of the day, I'm sorry, he doesn't want to hear the lowlights. He wants to hear the highlights. Okay, I'm just saying. That's something I had to contribute. All right, that's all you got to say. Oh, I had a lovely show. I, I, I was very impressed. That was a really nice venue. Um, we finally figured out that you could take a bus from <laughs> the convention center to the parking area. I think on the last day we figured that out. So other than that, which was our own silly fault. We should have like probably read any of the um, information about the show and probably would have found that out day one. But Well, there were signs at the uh, convention center, too. We just didn't see them because where we parked, we ended up kind of taking a little back way. And wow. so we didn't see the main signs. If you walk out the main entrance of the parking lot, that says, a bus will come by. Wait. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, It's certainly a really great show. Nice size. It wasn't too busy. You could pretty much, I think, play pretty much anything you wanted. Uh, yeah, I had a pretty good shot at getting in demos of pretty much every game that was there. I keep saying pretty much. But, oh man, I should have done this Q&A the day after because it's, geez, yeah. it feels yeah. like a lifetime ago now. Yeah, we've now. lived a few lives since then. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Dylan. Man, I'm trying to think of something good. Other than, yeah, it was just a, a very... Solid, well put together, fun convention. I, I guess really, you know what? Actually, looking at this, Dylan posted this before I actually did my full run through of the convention. Posted that, Dylan. I've done a full run through of the convention. I'm <laughs> sure I had a lot more to say in that video because I was actually there. Now that we've been here in America for what? How long have we been two here weeks now? now? Two weeks now? Oh yeah. my god. Feels like weeks. 20. <laughs> Feels like 20. Sorry. Yeah, and then we also had two weeks after the show where we were doing all this kind of crazy running around, buttoning up of our English life. Yeah. So we've kind of lived two different lives since then. Yep, but just do a search for Rado Runs Through UK Games Expo. You'll find it. And enjoy! Man, that was, that was a poor start. Let's see <laughs> if we can do better with Natalie. <laughs> Um, who wonders, how do we decide who will be first player? 
Do we follow the rule book every time? For example, in Super Motherload, starting player is the person who most recently dug a hole. Oh, yeah, I guess we do try and follow if there's some there's some reason for someone to be first player. But most of the time it's just him because he knows how to play the game and I want to watch him play his first round. Yeah, I was going to basically add that. Generally, I tend to go first solely so that I can basically articulate everything I'm doing step by step as a way to reinforce what I just taught about the rules. Or, barring that, to remind how the game works. Yep. I, you know... I, it's always a problem I have whenever I'm just playing in general that I try not to fall into Rado Rundisms through too much and just narrate every th- single thing from the beginning to end. Mm-hmm. But I definitely narrate the beginning of the game just to make clear, just to make sure that everything I know, everybody else knows too. And yeah, but if it's a game we know really well, um, geez, I know we we used to do rock paper scissors. I think for a while, back when we were normal people, yeah. instead of board game superstars. <laughs> um, and yeah, but we don't use any of those little apps that you can put your finger on the screen or... Yeah, but I mean, if it's a cute reason to start. But actually, I always have to admit, I'm, I was never a big fan of those back when we played for real and always ignore them because they tend to be written in such a way that the per, the, the same player will be first every single time, no matter what. Actually, I guess probably the most common way in in real practice is just take a piece from every player, kind of shuffle them mm-hmm. up in the hand, and then just randomly drop one. I think that's probably the most common thing we do. Yeah, we do that a lot. Yeah. Especially when we're playing with anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Daniel says, his wife is super cool about game nights uh, with her brand new gamer spouse. I guess congratulations are in order, Daniel. Sometimes she would prefer to play a game she already knows rather than learn a new one. Do you have any advice on finding balance on occasionally learning new games versus lovingly playing the tried and tested reliables? Does Jen ever suffer from not feeling like learning a new game? Yes. <laughs> Jen suffers greatly, but she is happy to do it. Well, you like new games too. I do. Don't you? I mean, you enjoy learning new games and playing new games. Yeah, but I also really enjoy playing games that I already know how to play. Then what advice do you have for finding a balance? Uh, don't have your husband be a professional game reviewer. Who Good has to go start. through a lot of games. Yep. That's, no, I mean... That provides no balance. Yeah. We got to play a few games when we were in England that were good good oldies, but goodies. But I was playing them to film them. Well. Ironically. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I'm afraid you, you've you've come to the wrong place, buddy. But I wouldn't imagine it's too terribly hard. Just choose to play old ones. Just do a 50-50. For every new game you play, play an old game. For every two new games, play an old game. There are many possible solutions one could come up with for a new, I guess, slightly less gamer spouse. Again, congratulations. Yep, but remember, happy wife equals happy life. What's happy husband equal? Nothing. (laughs) All right, there (laughs) you go. That rhymes with nothing. All right, well, then, (laughs) I guess you're SOL. Um... What games or teaching techniques would you suggest to ease into a field such as Castles of Burgundy? A feld. He must mean a feld. They said a field. Let me just finish. Oh, wait. Back to the old one. I have something else. How many times have we had to field questions from people saying, my wife won't play any game with me at all, ever. How do I get her to be interested? Um, So I would say, furthermore, um, to that point, if your wife is interested in playing any games with you, play the ones she wants to play. Indeed. Uh, or you may find yourself uh, with a wife who doesn't want to play any games with you at all. Indeed. And women tend to have about 7,000 things more on their minds than men do. So she may want to play old games because then she doesn't have to devote a lot of mental power to learning a new game. And if you want her to enjoy playing games with you, help her play the game she enjoys. Indeed. Okay. Little little soapbox there. All Stepping right. off. Good job. But just good advice for future. Because loads of people have wives that won't play. I said indeed. Indeed. <laughs> All right. What game or teaching techniques would you suggest to ease into a feld, such as Castles of Burgundy? I honestly feel like the variety of choice and symbolism in such a game might overwhelm her. But I also think this is one she could get into. Please help. 
So he's basically talking about games that there's a game where you're going to have to spend the first 20 minutes teaching how to play the game before you can make your first move because they're so... Um, geez. Uh, but let's see, you talked specifically about Burgundy. So let's think about that. What would you do? Uh, well, for starters, I would... I mean, a very, very important rule of thumb, a very easy trap to fall into is over-explaining. Explaining stuff they just don't need to know. Some players, of course, demand that you explain everything up front, but those tend to be players I don't want to play with um, because they're perhaps a bit too persnickety about such things. I, I try to explain... As much as you need to know to be able to make a turn or two and hopefully take care of the rest as the game goes so that uh, you can introduce concepts in situ when they are, you know, because uh, the, the learner is going to be able to internalize lessons much more readily if it's something they're facing right now as opposed to some future potential circumstance they might find themselves in. And so it always drives me nuts when somebody wants to sit down and teach every little minutia bit of the rule book right up front. So for Burgundy, honestly, there's not that much to teach right up front. You got to say, you know, here's the overall turn structure or, you know, uh, you know how we're, we're going to roll some dice and take them. And the dice, you know, really, but it boils right down to it, that most of the time, you're either going to use a die to grab a tile and put it into a slot, or to, I forget what they're called, the holding pens, I forget, whatever those slots are called, and, or you're going to use a die to take a tile that you previously collected and put it on a matching space on the board. I mean, that's what you're going to do the vast majority of the time. And, you know, I would get to rolling those dice as fast as possible and be the first player, as we mentioned just on the last uh, question, and articulate, right, okay, with these options, here's what I'm going to do. I could do this, this, or this, because these would all be interesting, but I'm going to do this one. And now, your turn. And, you know, don't be shy. The first few turns about saying, well, you know, okay, you know, here's some different things you could try. I mean, this would be a good one. Here's why. You know, maybe play the game for them just a little bit, just for the first turn or two. I mean, I know I am definitely very upfront. Well, I tend to be upfront anyway, but I'm certainly more so during those first few rounds um, because I've read the rule book. I have a much better idea how to play than Jen does. And so I'm very quick to say, well, you know, I, you know, you know, there, you've got this or this. I really think those probably one of those is going to help you um, X, Y, or Z. And I might do it until she says, "Okay, I got it. Fine, you can stop now." <laughs> um, but there's nothing wrong with that if it's coming from you know a place of trying to help as opposed to a place of just trying to drive the game. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I, I it's 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 about that. And you know, in Burgundy, at its heart, it's really simple. You you've got some dice options. The dice let you they, they limit you to certain numbers. You either take a tile or you place a tile, and yeah, and there's a million different types of tiles, sure. But I guarantee you, the first time you play, um, you know, based on their on her board, when it gets to her turn, you could probably recommend three or four different things she might want to do with those, and just briefly explain why, and um, let the game kind of evolve. I, that would kind of be my inclination if I were trying to teach Castles of Burgundy to some somebody who is not a heavy gamer uh, because a heavy gamer is the one who needs to know every single thing so that every single choice can be made with full <laughs> d um, due consideration of all the facets of blah, blah, blah. A, a regular casual gamer, you know, fewer choices is better. I mean, you know, there is a diminishing return point where too many choices just becomes overwhelming and meaningless yep. and, and not satisfying. I forget. I think I talked about that in a previous podcast because I remember reading it at some point that there's is some hard number Maybe it was seven or something like that. That's always a magic number. Yeah. Where more than this many options, the choice becomes, you know... Your, your brain just can't handle it. Yeah. And you just shut down. And you're looking for, please, give me something that will, you know, clear stuff out. Be that thing that helps, uh, you know, clear out and, you know, provide direction in those first few turns. Right. Moving on to Michael, who has been watching my videos for ages. Thanks for watching, Michael. Let's see here. Um, oh, right. Yeah, I, I remember reading this when it came in. Uh, Michael was commenting about how I've pontificated in the past about how I can find theme in any game. You you name it. I'll do it. I think I even maybe threw down a gauntlet about that last episode. Well, he says, okay, smart guy. 
Um, well, the best board game without a theme ever is Go, po- followed by Checkers. <laughs> uh, f- give me a theme, Smarty. He doesn't say that, but let's see. Well, <laughs> I mean, those are pure abstracts. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't trying to go, although honestly, actually, I, Go, you could easily apply a theme to Go. There is no reason Go isn't theme. I don't understand why anybody hasn't, because Go is public domain, of course, hasn't released a version of Go that is themed after, you know, microscopic cellular amoebas and whatnot. Basically, like growing and eating each other. Mm. Uh, you know, that's it's super duper simple. Um, in that, you know, because that's, man, I haven't played Go since I was a kid. I'm not even but, sure I know what But that is. is the one where you just put marbles on the board and you're trying to surround other marbles and there's restrictions about where you can and can't place them, as I recall. It's like Othello? But, um, yeah, Othello? I think Go is like Othello, but with marbles. Okay. Uh, pff, oh, man. Um, I'm, 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 it's an abstract game. I don't care about it. But I would probably try to theme Go after, you know, some kind of, like I said, microcellular organisms growing and expanding and multiplying and consuming each other. I think that could be made to fit without too terribly much trouble. And checkers is just a war game. Yeah. So and so is chess. I mean, they're pretty, you know, we're moving our our units forward to try to take out other units. Um, jumping from over one checker to another is it's obviously it's a military maneuver that takes out enemies and destroys them and removes them from the board. It's it's as thematic as um as as you want your imagination to let it to be. But still uh, I do, I am to me, I do prefer a little bit of theme, like what, say, Dominion gives you, so that, you know, that, that can pull us in a bit more. I mean, that's what I was talking about in the, uh, in the, it, with Gons, in the, what do you call it, the top 10 recap for Roland Rights, um, which I haven't actually recorded yet, but I'll be recording at some point after this, uh, when I played Gons recently, Gons Shown Clever, and I was just so shocked about how, yeah, I mean, why doesn't this have a theme? I, you could easily apply a theme to that game without even breaking a sweat, and it would have been so much more compelling. They opted not to, and I'm just not particularly excited about being really great in blue, or I'm the best orange player ever. No, I want to be the best at public works or or you know military conquest or whatever it might be. Um, so, But yeah, I mean, go and checkers. If you are interested in those games, I guess I'm just not interested in them, but I, I would totally... Think of them in thematic terms. Uh, checkers is going to be implicitly more interesting if you think of those as little guys. Here comes my little guy. You know, I mean, and you and you give them a persona, a sense of character. I mean, certainly when one of them makes it to the other side and becomes kinged or whatever they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. It seems to me the further back you go, the more simplistic game themes were uh, uh, as the more abstract. There are a few modern games that don't have a theme almost as a basis for its existence. And I think this might be a problem for the industry. There are so many... of oh, this is uh, Michael continuing. There's so many games out there, and coming out... Uh, you mentioned you read the rules for 700 plus a year. Do you worry about the wrong focus being increasingly applied in game design, diluting the market, and possibly causing problems for the industry going forward, despite the massive uptick of board game popularity? What, that they're being themed? No. Um, I think... Thematic integration into games only makes them better, stronger, more enticing and engaging experiences. So I don't, I don't see how, um, you know, that we're that we were better off a thousand years ago when all when any board game that existed was an abstract exercise like, I don't know, backgammon or what yeah, have you. Yeah, they probably had to be abstract back then because maybe you didn't know the same language as your opponent. Yeah, maybe that's a good point. That's interesting. Um, so I know I certainly don't think I I. Hey, there is, there has been over the last couple of years this very slight minor resurgence of hey, let's make some really polished, well produced abstract games, and they've just been done gangbusters. But they are the exception to the rule. I don't think there's any chance that no matter how successful Azul is or or what have you, that they're going to overtake thematic gaming because players like stories, people like stories, human beings like stories, and it's crazy to leave a story out when it's so easy to add one. I'm sorry, honey, do you have anything to say on that topic? Okay, alrighty. Anthony then wonders, do I have any tips for consuming lots of rule books? Oh my. Ketchup. Yes. <laughs> Except I don't like ketchup. Oh, well, mayonnaise then. Um, there you go, mayo. Well, yeah. <laughs> peanut butter. Peanut butter. Peanut butter helps. Um, let's see. Tips for consuming. Well, 
the, the thing is, the more you consume, the better you get at consuming them. I, you know, I, I'm pretty much to the point where I can recognize design tropes, for lack of a better term, pretty quickly. I can anticipate how a game is going to play. I can anticipate how the rules are going to be um, placed or, you know, designed, you know, halfway through a rulebook, just because I've kind of seen it all. And, you know, most things are building on the uh, what has come before. But one thing, I mean, gosh, actually, I think I would just have bad examples, but one thing I do to try and and consume more quickly, I almost never read examples. And I know that's bad because a lot of time rules writers will put important clarifications in the examples that are in the margins of rules. And I hate that. And I think it's so stupid. And I think it's kind of a lazy shortcut. You shouldn't have to read examples to know, but I'm just trying to read these things as fast as possible. And if I feel like I've got it without reading the example, I skip them. Certainly, I always skip whenever a rule book does the stupid thing of devoting the first five pages to, here's what this piece is. Here's the etymology of this particular card. And ah, stop it. I'll just skip ahead to, right, where's setup? I don't want any of this crap. I don't know any of this. Tell me the setup. Tell me the structure of the rules. And then I'll come back to this. And then I rarely do. Because, again, um, one, those opening sequences shouldn't exist in the first place. Um, And you can tell they shouldn't exist because that information is always dutifully repeated later in the rules. So why am I going to bother reading it twice? Once in the intro when it means nothing to me, and then later when it actually is meaningful. Uh, I'm ranting. Anthony, sorry. Apologize for that. But no, you just got to put your head down and plow through and just know the more you've read, the easier it will get in the future. Michael says, I'm so excited to hear the Project Elite is coming back. Yay! Uh, I never got to try it, but really wanted to. Um, do you know what kind of timetable we're out? Sorry, Michael. What? I, I have some information, but nothing I can say publicly. And... So I won't say anything. I don't even think I should have said it's confirmed. Because it hasn't been confirmed. I guess I unofficially confirmed it, which was not cool. I shouldn't have done that. Because uh, I know it set off a minor frenzy. It must have been right around the time you wrote this message, I guess. I don't remember. But yeah, it's coming back. It is awesome. That is great. And I think... I think I can't talk about it. Uh, because I think for the most part, it'll be very good. I think... From what I know, there are some things they're doing that I disagree with, but I shouldn't even be talking about that. And who knows? Maybe things will change. I've tried very, very hard to convince them of certain things. Ask me again (laughs) after it comes out, and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. But all I can say is I shouldn't have even said what I've said. So, shh, mum's the word. Hey, uh, we're back to Natalie, who has another question, which is Dungeon Pets is, in my opinion, one of the heaviest games to teach. So she wants to know, how long had we been gaming before we played Dungeon Pets for the first time, and was it hard to learn? You don't remember, do you? You just know it now. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a very hard game to learn. And in fact, I have successfully, uh, back when I was living in Pytoon's apartment when we first moved to Malta before you showed up, I taught... What was her name? Jen Martell, who was an artist who had never played a modern board game in her life, how to play Dungeon Pets as her gateway game. And honestly, I didn't think it was that hard. I guess that's not true. I mean, there's a... Again, it gets back to what I was talking about earlier. The mistake is teaching too much. Just bear it... Just pare it down to the absolute bare minimum somebody needs to know. Certainly when you are teaching the the introductory elements, uh, when you're trying to get somebody's head around Dungeon Pets, don't say anything about the gosh darn cards. Don't talk about the cards and how they represent the different needs and how, you know, when you get halfway through a round, we're going to have to take care of the needs of our pets. So you got to be prepared for that. Just don't bother with that. Um, you know, teach that when it gets there, because the first round of the game is pretty easy going and, um, that you just don't need to know that. The only thing you really need to understand at the beginning of Dungeon Pets is, right, we're trying to take care of these pets and grow them because at some point in the future, look, you can't even see yet, but at some point we're going to find out that they can um, engage in contests and they can be sold. Actually, I think it's actually kind of useful that at the beginning of Dungeon Pets, you don't really know much about the future needs um, because they haven't been revealed yet. Or wait, no. 
I think you reveal... The buyers? No, I don't think... I, I don't remember. I have to look again. You either don't reveal the first buyer or you don't reveal the first... I think you reveal the first couple of contests and you don't know about any of the buyers, the specific wants, mm -hmm. or it's vice versa. I forget which one it is. But it's good that not all of it's there um, because that's just one less thing you have to teach people. What you need to teach them is the very, very kind of difficult to grok auction system um, because the toughest thing about Dungeon Pets is the moves are made in secret. That is always hard. It's it's why, um, what do you call it? Burgundy is actually a fairly easy game, I think, to teach because there's nothing in secret. It's all public information. So you can see what they're doing and you can help them through their turn. Dungeon Pets, it's much harder because they have to make informed decisions about how to bundle up their imps and their money and all of that stuff. And that is very, very hard. Um, one thing I do when I teach Dungeon Pets, because I've done it a few times, like I said, including uh, to Miss Jen Martell, the first game she ever played, is I actually leave the, 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 the hidden thing down and I show, here's one way I could do it. If I want to do a lot of stuff this turn, I want to send all of my imps out as individuals. And so I just say, this is what it would look like. I Look, I, I'm going to... I forget what it is. I think you get seven imps at the beginning. I don't remember. Mm. I'd have to look. But I get... Let's say it's seven imps. I could put them all in their slots. That means I'm going to do seven things. Because look at all this stuff. I could go get some food. I could go get a new cage. I could adopt a monster. I could go and get an artifact. There's a lot of cool things I can do. But here's the problem. Um, let's say you didn't do it that way, and you bundled yours up as a three, a two, a two, and a one. When we reveal you will get to go first because you'll have this group of three and a big group gets to go before a single. They just kind of muscle everybody else out. And then, oh, look, you get to go again because you you put two guys and they beat all my guys. And then you get to go again. That means with this setup, you get to go three times before I get to do anything. And by the time I get to go, all the stuff I wanted is gone. So that's why I've got to think about how important are things. I mean, and, uh, you know, it's it's trying to uh, yeah that's a that's a tough thing it's a really unique element uh, to dungeon pets and it, in part to understand how to make those decisions you have to know what all the options are and I know that's tough because that means you have to explain everything but 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 not really um, you know you could almost let the first round of dungeon pets go and say you know what why don't you just choose one of each uh, um, and we'll see what I do I wouldn't necessarily do that I'm literally thinking out loud uh, it's a tough thing to teach but. The most important thing you need to know is the the more you bundle them up, the fewer actions you get to do, but the more likely you are to go first. Let's start going. And, oh, okay, look, you get to go now. Whether I went first, you went first. Let's talk about what you might want to take. What are really valuable things out here? These artifacts are awesome. They'll give you a power for the rest of the game. Um, you know, this one does this, that one does that. But you know what? Uh, if you want to have more than one pet on the go, you might want to get another... Um, uh, cage because hey look here's a cage that provides meat mm -hmm. and look over here here's a meat eating pet if you could get that and that those will work really well together and you can see that you get to make two turns in a row before I get to go based on how things were bundled those that might be a good one two combo and then you hope you can get the artifact later because you don't know what I'm going to do <sighs> it's tough um, that's a tough game it's a complex game, but still, I it'd be I think that would be the t the way I'd go about it. Still, trying to not overload the player because you could easily spend a half an hour teaching before anybody makes their first turn, and then they've forgotten all the stuff at the beginning. Exactly, they will forget it all anyway. So you might as well just embrace that and say, "Look, don't worry. If this is going to be a learning game, you're not going to play the most optimal, efficient way to go. Let's just go with the flow and have a good time. Here's some of this, the basics you need to know, and we'll try to pick it up as we go. Oh, all right. But I, I understand. It's it, That's a tough one. I just bought Pandemic Legacy Season 1. How many times should we play it in real pandemic mode before starting the campaign? Uh, hmm. yeah. um, as many times as you want. Mm -hmm. A pandemic by itself is just a great game. Yeah. Um, you know, we played it dozens of times before we ever played Pandemic uh, Legacy. I think he's asking that to get the feel of how to play Pandemic anyway. Maybe yeah, just, yeah, five times. Okay, Jen says five, six, five to six times. All right, there you go. I it's I, it's to taste. How much salt should I put in this soup? <laughs> I don't know. How long? However much stream? it tastes good. Yeah, I I I, I would say once. You play it once, and then 
If you say, hey, that was fun, let's try it again, then play it a second time. Play it until you think, man, I'd like to see something more. I'd like to see something a little bit different. Or, I just can't wait any longer. I want to start doing the, uh, you know, play it as much as you want. But play it at least once. Definitely. All righty. And Jen says five or six times. Do we play with music ambiance uh, or in complete silence? Most of the time with, with music. Yes. For years, we pretty much played without, but it's when I got the table the you know that first geek and sun table and uh, i did the video for it and i mentioned hey yeah it's got this cool i think it was it was it a blu-ray yeah uh, you know blu-ray and so i've been playing with that that's really awesome and somebody posted on the video i did for the table have you heard of melodice and i said no and they i found it out and we use melodice all the time i'd be asking what's melodice it's you know http colon slash slash m e l o d i c e not Melody, but Melodice, Melodice.org, not .com. Go there, type in the name of whatever game you're going to play, and it will make a cool playlist of music that is thematically appropriate for the game. It's awesome. We use it all the time. We absolutely love it. Okay. And uh, that's it. Brian. Brian says, Hey, you love dice drafting, but what about Yes Fan? Uh, yes, fan. Uh, have you played it? It was one of the first, if not the first, dice drafting game, certainly to be pop- popular back in 2006. For a while, it was the reference game when you're talking about dice drafting. Have we played it? If so, uh, did you not like it? Do you feel it lacks in two player? I love all the player counts. Uh, my one criticism is there is an overpowered strategy, the corner shop caravan strategy. The small expansion uh, that wasn't too hard to get when the game was more popular solved this as well. We played it. It was definitely one of the games we played in the first couple of years. I I couldn't tell you anything about it though. For whatever reason, it failed to it it failed to make a dent. It well, actually, let me look on Board Game Geek. Did I even mark that I ever owned it? I think maybe I didn't because I just literally just didn't remember anything about it. I'm sure it's fine. You're not the first person to mention it to me when I talk about how much I love dice drafting, and I probably should go back and try it again. But yeah, I, I, it just like I said, it just didn't stick. It was just one of several games at that time when we were still first new into gaming. We were trying a little bit of everything. We we're like, well, yeah, okay, that was that was fine. But why would we play that again? We can play any of these other amazing things. Well, let's go play Twa or Trajan again instead. Uh, um, let's see. Did I say anything about it? No. Oh, okay, I do have it marked as previously owned. And anything I mark as previously owned, I mark why I got rid of it. So... Unfortunately, we're in the back room in my mom's house, and the Wi-Fi in here is very slow. So I'm trying to vamp until the thing will actually show me what I said. Honey, you don't remember this at all, do you? No. See, that's the thing. Jen doesn't... I I don't remember it, so Jen couldn't possibly remember it. It just wasn't very memorable, I guess. But I'm almost there. It's... Oh. (laughs) I wrote, it's just okay. (laughs) So back when I did remember about it, that's what I thought. I couldn't tell you why. Like I said, you're not the first person to mention it to me that it's a really... But somehow it just didn't float my boat, so I couldn't tell you. Uh, but maybe I'll try it again someday. But let's move on to Chris, who wants to hear more about my role-playing game roots. Honey, you have no role-playing game roots. None. You barely even know what Dungeons & Dragons is. I barely know what that is. Okay. That's there you all. go. That's what I said. I said you barely know, and you said, "I yes, I barely know." Um, it, full of disdain, and how could I say such a thing when you, in fact, agreed with me? Um, I I was less geeky. Yes. Than some women. Well, the thing is, I I had when I was probably I don't know eleven, twelve. It, it I got I forget which box one of the the intro box ones, and I really liked it a lot. And then after that. I, there was a local library that actually had the, you know, the hardback bound books. And so I started reading through all of them, you know, the monster manuals and the dungeon and the player manuals and all that. I devoured that stuff and I spent many, many hours making dungeons and dividing characters and all stuff. But I never, you know, that was when I was living on the boat. I didn't have any friends to play with. Uh, there were no other kids around. My brother wasn't that in, as I recall my brother wasn't that interested in it although I did there I remember one time trying to play it with my brother and my mom with me as a dungeon master and it just didn't go very well so I was really super duper heavy into it 
but never actually got to play it. Um, I guess I was just a tourist. And to this day, as far as I know, I can't recall ever playing a full, proper role-playing game experience. So I don't have any background roots either, other than just a deep abiding love that um, to this day is still unfulfilled. <laughs> All righty. And Jen's got nothing on that one. But moving on to... 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 To Paul. All right. I uh, see. Although, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. So first of all, Paul, um, I did read your message when it came in. And that was beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing it with me. Uh, it was very, very touching. And you had a question as well. So let me scroll down to that. Let's see here. E right. You said... You said in the last podcast you could sell the theme of a game deemed themeless. Uh oh, man, I made trouble for myself. Another uh, here we go. As um, a long while ago, you deemed seasons as being just numbers with no real theme. I love seasons and believe theme can be seen in any game you're in love with. Uh, how could you resell this to me as not being themeless? Did I say that about the seasons? Oh, I barely remember seasons, Paul. I'm so sorry. It had the big chunky dice, didn't it? And wasn't it? It's just... Oh, I don't know why I said that. That's not true. It's clearly not a themeless game. Why did I say that? I'd have to go back and watch the video, Paul. But you know what? I'm going to retract that. I'm going to issue a Rotto Retracts. <laughs> Seasons is not a themeless game. Um, I don't know what the heck I... I I, I'm going to call you out, Paul. I'm saying I didn't say that. You're taking me out of context. Because it's clearly a, a very... Um, themeful game with the notion of the passage of time and the different dice representing, if I recall correctly, the different seasons, but all the characters were very thematically grounded. Yeah. Um, I can't sell you that on being themeless because it is definitely a themed game. Definitely. I must have been... I, 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 I was having an off day when I filmed that. No is my, marshmallows in your cocoa that day? That must have been it if I liked either marshmallows or cocoa, neither of which I like. Um... Right, yeah. So, sorry about that, Paul. I, I, I stand corrected. You got me. It's totally themed. Danny. Danny says, Do you ever get distracted while doing run-throughs at conventions? Are you in the zone? Oh, because you saw me at UK Games Expo. Um, the toughest thing for me is when I first start filming. I mean, at any given video. The first 30 seconds are the hardest. And Jen can confirm, I often start over and over and over again with many expletives thrown in <laughs> in between. And uh, because once I get going, then yeah, it just kind of flows. And I don't really have to think of, well, that's not true. I'm, I'm thinking a lot. But it, it, yeah, there is, there is a flow to it. There is a zone that I get into. Uh, and I would imagine the same is true. If anything, I would say maybe it's easier to get into the quote zone when I'm at a convention because I just got to knuckle down and get through. I I don't have the luxury of the, thank seven you. starts. Yeah, the luxury of, oh, no one's here. And Jen will just cover her ears <laughs> and try not to hear my cursing in the other room um, <laughs> as I just go, ah! Uh, you know, at a convention, I you know, I just gotta go. I just gotta muscle through. Whether I whether I feel whether I got the feeling or not, I, I just gotta make it work. Um, Jen says her, oh, whoops, oh, and the second one is, that's not a game-related question, so we'll come back to your non-game-related question, Danny, in the personal section, when, uh, you ask Jen, what are the five things that make London her favorite city? Okay. Oh, and also, honey, here's a picture he took of us at the show. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, that's a picture That's of a us. good picture. It is a good picture. All right. Thomas says, what is the most thematic game of Steffenfeld and why? Um, it's, for a while I said Aquasphere. I might still say Aquasphere. Or, yeah, I'm going to say Aquasphere. And actually, I believe in the run-through I did for it, in the Final Thoughts, I talked exactly about this topic, why it was his most thematic game. So you can go check out my Final Thoughts for Aquasphere. Yes, honey pie? <sighs> I want some hot chocolate. So... We're almost done, honey pie. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, right. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, but and do you want some marshmallows in it? I want mint. Oh, do we have such things here? Yes, your oh. mom has some junior mint cocoa. Oh my goodness! I know. Have you tried it yet? No. Oh my god! This well, you'll have to hold on. Yep. We'll have that for the personal question and answer. So anyway, Aquasphere, 
Totally. And why? Go check the run through. What is the most thematic game of Uwe Rosenberg and why? All, all his games are hugely thematic. You'd be better off asking what's his least thematic game. They're all equally thematic. Mm. I mean, Agricola is an incredibly thematic game, as is Caverna, as is Lahav, as is... Jeez. 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 Is there one that's more thematic? I don't think so. I... Didn't he do Quilt Show and stuff, too? Yeah, I mean, like I said, yeah. Or he didn't do Quilt Show. He did, um, you're thinking, there were two Quilt games that came out the same. Yeah. He, and his was Patchwork. Patchwork. And that's not very thematic. That's much more abstract, although it's still kind of a little bit thematic. Yeah. But, no, I mean, of his, I mean, Gates of Lo Yang is just as thematic as Agricola, is just as thematic as Mercador, is just as thematic as Lahav, is just as thematic as any of his. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I'm i going to call a tie on that one. What is the most thematic game of Michael Kiesling? And why? Okay. Ooh. That, okay. Ooh. Let's see. Can it be Kiesling and Kramer, or does it have to be just Kiesling? Because that limits it a little bit. Let's pull up a list of his games, because I don't think I've done a top ten of his. So, I need to do an advanced search on Board Game Geek. Oh, but right, it's going so slow in here. All right, designer. Kiesling. K-I-E-S-L-I-N-G. Michael. No expansions. And then I will be able to tell you once I see the uh, massive list of games he's done. This one, yeah, honey pie. I'm going to go get some cocoa. All right. Because this has nothing to this do with me. This has nothing to do with you. <laughs> I'm going to think about it. Cocoa! Cocoa! Woo, cocoa! Hmm, let's see. Cole Baron? Ooh, to call two. To call two is currently in the lead. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it might be to call. Nauticus? No, no, no. Still to call too. Sansuchi? No. Ooh, Riverboat. I haven't played Riverboat. No, I'm still going with to call too. Reworld. Ooh. Oh, now it's tied between to call too and Reworld. Oh my gosh, this is such a long list of games. That man is amazing. All right. Having briefly scanned his list, I'm going to go with to call too or Reworld. And. It's going to have to be To Call 2. To Call 2 is the winner. Why? I mean, just look at it. I mean, the thing is dripping with him. The thing actually comes with a comic book in the instruction manual that teaches you the backstory of the game and explains and demonstrates thematic reasonings behind all the the uh, mechanisms of the game. It's a, a lovely, wonderful thematic game. Uh, actually, I enjoyed it more than regular To Call, mostly because it works better as a two-player game than straight To Call. And uh, yeah, that's uh, it's. I mean, it's it. it if, if you if you check it out, go check out my run through. It'd be hard to you'd be hard pressed not to agree that this is the most thematic game. And now the most thematic game of Reiner Knizia and why? Oh my gosh, I can't look at his whole list of games. Oh, uh, it's, and besides, I don't have to. It's easy. Star Trek Expeditions is Reiner Knizia's most thematic game because. It's uh, it's the closest thing he's ever going to do to an Ameritrash game. It's a, it's a Euro with Ameritrash style um presentation. Because there's actual, uh, it's an episode of Star Trek you have to play through with different plot lines that you have to follow, and all the mechanisms are driven by Trek conventions of, you know, Kirk being the the brave leader and Spock being the cool, calm, um, calculating guy and Bones ca- saving people's lives. It's an incredibly thematic experience, and it's 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 a blast. I really love it. Um, of course, I'm a big Star Trek nerd, so no surprise there. On a more generic front, what would you say is the most useful way to implement theme into a dry Euro? Is it simply the artwork? No, no, no. The, the thing, more than anything else, to my way of thinking, that makes a Euro thematic is that the choices you are making feel like they are driven by the activity being simulated, if that makes sense. Um, like, oh, what's an example? Um, you know, Agricola is obviously a very, very thematic Euro. It's not because of the art, although the art certainly helps. It's because the, um, you know, the, the fundamental actions... The limitations that are placed on you are driven... Well, they're not driven by theme, but they feel like they are. Oh, I've got a mama and a papa. That means that uh, if papa can go do one thing, mama can go do something else. And, you know, in this kind of socialist utopia, medieval farming village, 
where everybody shares access to everything. Oh, if somebody took out the plow, then nobody else can use it. And, you know, it's the basics of worker placement. It's just implicitly thematically grounded. And as your family grows, you can do more stuff. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it basically just comes down to that. It's, it's about do the choices I'm making, the structures that the game makes me work within, the limitations that the system puts on me, do they in some way tie back to what those choices, structures, and limitations would I would face in real life? The farther away you get from that, the less thematic it is. And that's a shame. But you know what? One thing that never really bothers me, one at level of abstraction in Euro that I think is always fine, is the notion that... I'm thinking, I need some cocoa now, too. My throat's getting sore. Oh, that there's just some kind of randomizer. There's, you know, whether it's, you know, the dice you're going to draft at the beginning of every round or the cards you draw. Because, you know, one thing that's going to be very difficult to simulate in any kind of Euro simulation is the whole wide world of opportunities that could appear before you in on any given day of the week or any given month of the year or any given year of in your life um you know these games replace a simulation that keeps track of thousands of other people who are all doing things that will then make things fall into your lap that you can take advantage of euros emulate that by hey let's roll these five dice and then draft or let's draw our hand of cards or let's put um the different let's seed the different Worker placement spots with different, uh, you know, uh, resources you could collect. The, um, you know, it's random, and that's fine. Because, you know, in your life, you don't control everything. A lot of the stuff that comes to you is based, for all intents and purposes, completely random, based on what other people have chosen. And I think it's totally cool that a Euro is fundamentally driven by that random structure. Because in that case, that randomness is is a mechanism that's representing something from the real world. Which is to say... All the other, uh, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions of people that exist in your sphere that end up creating opportunities for you to exploit. Right. Um, other game-related questions. How would you rank Dragonfire? Why is it not ranked on your list? Does the new expansion have changed anything? It's not my final list because... I tend to think of it, and this is not the only game I do this with, I tend to think of it functionally, in my mind, as an expansion of uh, Shadowrun Crossfire, because they're basically the same game. I don't really see the reason to... I mean, because they're they're so close. Hey, I've already ranked one. I just think of Dragonfire as, oh, I'm playing Shadowrun Crossfire, but in a fantasy setting instead. So I just don't rank it for that reason. That's the same reason I don't rank Pandemic. Um... The Legacy Seasons 1 and 2. I just rank Pandemic. Because to me, the Legacy games, they're just kind of offshoots. They're just things that increase my overall enjoyment of the base experience. So that's why Dragonfire doesn't list. That said, I do think Shadowrun Crossfire is a much better game. For reasons I mentioned in my run-through of Dragonfire. Um, Let's see. I know there are... Oh, you're still on Dragonfire. All righty. Uh, a little voice in my head saying, you should play Gloomhaven instead of Dragonfire. I ask because it's a problem for my wife and I. We like Gloomhaven so much, any high fantasy card driven game, especially with the campaign. Uh, dude, um, honestly, if, if you've got Gloomhaven in your life, I, you do have to ask, why bother playing anything else? Um, I mean, I, I like Dragonfire. If, you, if I had the option to sit down and play one or the other, I would play Gloomhaven over Dragonfire. I mean, Dragonfire is nice because you can play it in 20 minutes. And that includes potentially setting up and putting it away for 25 minutes. And you sure can't do that with Gloomhaven. So that's a good reason to put it on yourself, I suppose. On a normal day, how many hours do you dedicate to board games? All of them. Um, Because he adds email, reading, rules, filming stuff. In a perfect world, how many hours would you like to dedicate to board games? Less of them. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's... I'll say eight hours a day, because I do tend to think of Rado Runs Through as a normal 40-hour of a week job if you expand beyond just playing and filming games. It's a silly question, but he's going to ask anyway. Jen's oh. back, by the way. <laughs> if I had to choose between no more board games or no more TV shows, which would it be? Honey. Oh my gosh. If you had to give up TV or board games? I'd give up TV. Mm. I'd give up board games. Gasp. I guess we better not do that then. All right, let's not give up either. All righty. Um, he didn't ask why, though, so we get off scot-free. 
I have the feeling you are somehow more optimistic about games when you talk about them in your podcast than when you review them in your final thoughts. In the podcast, any game seems quite easily fantastic, which is not the case in your videos. Um, I don't... There's some space between, maybe. I don't know. Because when you're doing a run-through or final thoughts, you're right there with it, so everything's very fresh. And when you're doing a podcast, you're just relying on your memory, and probably you remember all the good stuff and... Maybe not the bad stuff. Maybe I do. You're it is certainly true. I tend to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, <laughs> and I don't go with Mister In Between. Um, and I don't think about the bad times. I only think about the good times. I, you know, it's funny. I mean, I know at all the various jobs I've had over my life that you know Jen can confirm there were things that drove me absolutely nuts. But I don't remember what those are. I just I know intellectually. Yeah, there were things that drove me nuts. I just think about the good stuff. So yeah, maybe that's a facet to it, but I do I talk about games very much? Specific games on the podcast? I don't think I do. Well, like you've just been asked about Dragonfire. Well, yeah, but I mean, well, sure. Um, although I didn't say it was fantastic, I said I liked uh, Shadow and Crossfire more. I, I, you know what, um, Thomas, you'd have to come at me with some specific examples of of a game where I said, eh, it's okay in my original um, run through, but then when I talked about it later on the podcast, I said it was fantastic. And I would go and evaluate that, and I would try to dig a little deeper. So I put it, Jonas, on you, Thomas. I'm flipping right back to you. How much of the political opinion of a designer would influence the way you feel about his or her games? It's a frequent topic with literature and cinema, cinema, but not so much board games, for instance. Would you still enjoy Gloomhaven if you found out that Isaac uh, Childress was a ferocious Trump supporter? Who knows? Maybe he is. Um, would Stefan Feld be your favorite designer if you found out his favorite book was Mein Kampf? Uh, I'm exaggerating, I know. Um, I would not have a... I, I've long been... Do you have anything to say on that topic, honey pie? Um, well, we've played with Isaac. Yes. So no, he's... I think that if, if something came out in us playing with him <clears throat> that I found objectionable, then yes, it would it would affect my enjoyment of his games. Uh-huh. So I would if I've read something about him that I found objectionable, would it... Impact my enjoyment of his games. Well, let's just go. If, in fact, Isaac Childress were pro-Trump, would you want to play Gloomhaven? I don't know. I think you'd have to look at, does that come through in the game? I mean, so would you want, would, you know, would you be rewarded for being a robber baron or, you know, something like that? Mm-hmm. As opposed to being a, you know, somebody who goes out and does good things along the roadside with helping vagrants or something. I, I don't know. I didn't, there's no sense of either of those being the right or wrong way in Gloomhaven. So if if he was, then I would say I can't tell. So no, it would not affect my enjoyment of his games. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I can definitely say no, it wouldn't, um, because I'm a fan of the Beatles. And hey, John Lennon sang about beating his wife. You know, I used to be cruel to my woman. I beat her and kept her apart from the things she loves. Man, I was mean, but I'm changing the scene. I'm doing the best that I can. Got to admit, it's getting better, better, a little better all the time. It can't get no worse. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm a proponent of separate the artist from the art. Um, everybody's got skeletons in their closet, and I'm just here to have a good time. Yeah, so if uh, Stefan Feld was a closet Hitler fanatic, I would still very much enjoy Castles of Burgundy. I would condemn him, but I would not condemn his wonderful game. Unless, as Jen said, somehow his game was a platform for... Um, his own personal beliefs. That's that's just how I roll. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that was the choice I had to make when I found out years ago that yeah, I, John Lennon had a dark past. Um, and uh, and it's funny, I, I don't even think I knew it from listening to the song. I thought, oh, that must just be uh, what do you call it, metaphorical? Nope, it was quite literal. <laughs> um, yeah, he, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. No, also, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, Jen, I talk about this a lot. I tend to be very forgiving and very. Uh, Try to give people a second chance and, you know, try to outreach and understand them and all that. So, I don't know. Better to build bridges than burn them down. Uh, even if you don't like what's on the other side of the riverbank. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Riverboat? You've ranked it pretty high. Is it balanced for two players? Is it too mean? Um, no, uh, we've only... we played Riverboat was one of the last games we played right before we left Malta. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know if Jen... And um, I had meant to, to film it and I just ran out of time. 
And, um, you know, because we had to get everything in a box and shipped. And so I do plan on filming it in July um, now that we're in America and our stuff is going to be showing up. Suffice to say, I mean, and although actually I'd, also I would want to play it at least one more time before I filmed it. But yeah, we liked it. And at first glance, it's, I, at first glance, I thought it was the best Keesling game that came out of last year. And this year when what, four big games came out from him and they were all excellent. But I had problems with all of them except for Riverboat. Riverboat was pretty much flawless. Um, although, again, I'd want to play it one more time just to be sure. Honey, the last one is for you. Okay. She was about to leave. Um, if you had to design a glass chess pieces inspired by a board game, what game would that be? Hmm. But it would be for chess, right? Chess pieces. Uh, he says chess pieces. So, yeah. So, I, but I guess, yeah. So, it would have to be the pawns and the king and the queen and the rook and all that. But... Themed after some game. Mm. I don't know. Yep. I would. That would be one of those things that somebody would commission me to do, and we would work in tandem, and we would feed feed off of each other's energy, because I don't have an interest in doing that just on my own. Um, somebody did suggest it when I first started making glass. Just you know, a fellow maker says, "Oh, you should make glass chess pieces," and I thought about it for a while, and I just it didn't go anywhere. Um, mm. So. I think it would have to have the energy of, of somebody who's really interested and excited about about something in particular to make that work for me. Okay. Because I do like working um, in collaboration with people. I think it's it's really lovely. <laughs> okay. Last one. Uh, Natalie is back a third time, I believe. Woo! Wondering, um, there are still games being posted that were filmed in Malta. Is this because of the move or were vi videos being delayed saved? Yes, that's exactly what it is. We knew this was coming. So throughout February and early March, I filmed, we played and filmed games like Demons. Uh, I, I played a ton. And actually, every run through that's going to be posted in July is going to be something I filmed back in the first couple of months back in Malta. Because where we are now, it's pretty much impossible for me to film run throughs. So yeah, it was just, and it, it's not the first time I did it. Last year, um, when we were on our long, month-long trip to Africa... That was two years ago. Two years ago, I had just filmed a ton of games up front just to make sure I'd have coverage. And so, yeah, this was just a bigger one because I knew throughout July, you know, June, July, and August it was going to be tough for me to be filming anything. Have you played Isle of Sky Journeyman yet? If so, did you like what it brought to the game? No, so I don't know. But I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and... That's it, folks. That is the game-related stuff. Hold on for a second. I'm going to go, and I'm not going to get some cocoa, but I need something to drink before we get back for the personal Q&A. We'll be right back. Okie doke, everybody. Questions and answers of a personal nature. Although not always quite so personal. Starting with this one from Jason. Hey, honey pie. Yes. Have you ever seen the Gloucester cheese roll? <laughs> no, apparently not. But no? I I'm going to Google it. Uh, actually, uh, Jason sent a linker along. So here, I'll just a go A linker ahead. along? A uh, linker along. Uh, I, yes, Jason, I am aware of it. It is quite silly. I don't understand. I have not looked into it. I am about to show it to Jen for the first time. You see, honey, it's it's a hill mm -hmm. in, in, in Gloucester. And there, let's just skip ahead here a little bit. Oh, dear. Here they go. Oh, my gosh. People. They're rolling. Oh. Yep. Oh, they're having so much fun. It looks very painful. Oh, it sure does, doesn't it? Oh, look at those poor people. <laughs> they're oh. very dirty. Oh, look what happened to him. Oh, he's he's having a good time, isn't he? <laughs> All right. Are they going to be showing some more of the silliness? There's some more. I, th I thought there would be some cheese. I think cheese is involved somehow. Or, yeah, they're chasing cheese. That's what it is. There's a cheese roll, and they all chase it, and they end up rolling more than the cheese. And there you go. Uh, yeah. Well, Jason, you've expanded Jen's outlook on the human condition <laughs> in ways that I'm sure are unknowable. And uh, on the zaniness of British people. Yes. Lucas, meanwhile, um, asks that in the last podcast, I mentioned Better Call Saul the uh, ba Breaking Bad spinoff, and have I seen Breaking Bad, how would I compare them? Jen probably doesn't have much to say since she wouldn't like Breaking Bad, correct? Or, nor would she like Better Call Saul. But what about you? To me, 
Better Call Saul seems a little shallow compared to its big brother. Lucas, you're crazy! Um, I yes, I, I love Breaking Bad, of course. And I have to admit, when that question came up, my first thought was Breaking Bad. But then, for my money, I think Better Call Saul is the better show. Uh, and what you call shallow, I would just call more subtle. I mean, Breaking Bad is a very flashy show. It's a very bombastic, in-your-face. It's very over-the-top. It's... It's a little out of touch with reality when it boils right down to it. Better Call Saul, it's it's the same. It to me, they feel very very similar. They're sister shows after all, but um, you know, and, and and of course, they're both kind of tracking the downfall of a of a once good man, um, you know, and and you know, as they become something else due to their circumstances. But you know, Better Call Saul, it's you know the the interplay between him and his brother. Uh, you know, the, the lovable loser nature of Saul himself. I, it's just a phenomenal show. And I have to say of the two, I, I actually enjoy. I, I think Saul is the better, the 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 more... Well, see, it's not more powerful. Because again, Breaking Bad is just so big and so explosive and just insane. But it's, I mean, it, it's it's practically science fiction. Whereas Better Call Saul is, is, is a much more grounded and real and touching... Um, you know, human drama for my taste, anyway. But yeah, I mean, don't get wrong. I love Breaking Bad too. I mean, everybody does, except for Jen. Let's see here. Scott says the movie chat last month got me wondering if we've seen the Push, a movie, uh, and what would we do if we were in that circumstance? Well, I have not seen it, so let's go to IMDb the Push. Uh, and while I'm looking that up, we'll let Daisy in because we left her out. Oh no! Oh, the Push is that the yeah, it must be. Yeah, we did see the push. Uh, it was that Darren Brown one. Oh gosh. Uh, let's see. Or, or, oh no, no, no. He's not. He must be talking about this. Uh, let's see. There's a there's a 2015 documentary, Hamilton Zero Tolerance for Violence Policy, exploring the Coleman Ferguson incident. He must mean Darren Brown's the push, though. I bet because I've never heard of this thing. And honey, would you do the push? I mean, well, we don't know. No, the, the, the whole point of that show, if in fact you're talking about Darren Brown's The Push, is, I mean, we, we can't know because we haven't been put through that circumstance. I'm sure anybody would like to say, of course. Not. Of course not. I would never do it. <clears throat> but, I mean, I, I, I will never know unless I get randomly chosen by no. Darren Brown to be put through that. No, because remember, even to be considered for it, they had to be um, of the persuasion of uh, persuasive format. I mean, so somebody like me who I don't even, I don't even want to listen to commercials because I know I'm easily suggestible. That is true. I would not be a person that could be targeted by that. Well, no, I mean, that means you are a tar- person that could be targeted by that. Yeah, but that means I'm on my guard extra a lot. And so I don't... Right, but I you're would... on your guard when you're in situations where you know that the thing being presented to you is intended to to sway your actions. So you're on guard because you know you're so suggestible. And you know that for a fact. You know how bad commercials can yes. just get you to do anything they want. Well, didn't I just so, say about marshmallows and cocoa, and then three minutes later, I was like, I, I need some chocolate. Yeah, you you, uh, <laughs> you swayed yourself. I'm like, what? Um, so that's oh. interesting. Do, do you think that means you would you would have done the push? No, I know I wouldn't have done the push. Because I think that there's a line where you know what's right and wrong, and you just don't do what's wrong. Oh, look. Oh, it looked like it was suddenly snowing um, something out the window, but it was just pollen off of the trees. Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know. I'd like to say I wouldn't, but... Um, and I would, I'm also, I tend to think I'm re- probably not quite so readily swayed by stuff. I know I've tried to be hypnotized and I can't be, you know, um, or I don't know if I can or can't be, but I, I've tried and, and I was not prone to suggestibility is what I was told. So yeah, I don't know. Um, let's see here. Henrik. Oh, and by the way, folks, for people wondering, what the heck is the push? It was a Darren Brown experiment where he tried to architect a situation where a normal everyday person could be led to a point in their life, in in the space of like one day, where they would murder an innocent person, effectively, uh, um, for completely justified reasons. Uh, would they Would they do it? Uh, that's what the push was, and uh, I don't know. I I I I'd, I'd love to find out. So bring it, Darren. All righty. Mm-hmm. Henrik says, um, wait, no, we're coming back to Henrik because, honey, it's going to be some wisdom of the month. 
uh, is what Henrik needs to know from you. But in the meantime, Daniel wants to know, Rado, you seem like a tall guy. How well do you sleep in it? Describe... All right, how well do you sleep in it? I did not. I was just waiting for Jen to say a con would be discomfort. Oh. But apparently uh, that was not a con for Jen. For normal-sized people, it's not a problem. No. We had a uh, memory foam mattress that was, I don't know, an inch and a half thick, maybe two inches, maybe. Yeah, somewhere in there. And yeah, it was fine, but the the bongo we, it it was a pop top, so you're supposed to sleep upstairs um, on the roof. And certainly one problem is if you're doing that. Well, like Jen said, it could be cold because you're pretty much out in the elements. But that wasn't a problem to me. It was more problem the noise. And you're not sleep if you're not sleeping inside, you you have a lot more ambient sound outside. And uh, you know, so if that's gonna be a problem for you, I mean, I don't know. I spend most of my life sleeping with earplugs anyway because there's enough ambient noise in the bedroom I'm sleeping <laughs> in, thanks to certain ladies that are in the vicinity. He's talking about the beagles. They snore. Yeah, not me. Not I'm me. only talking about the beagles who mm. snore. Yep, just them. So, I mean, that's kind of a problem. There's a, but, uh, I, I don't know, yeah, I am tall. I mean, but, you know, you, you, it's not like you can stand in the van either. You have to crawl around. Yeah, but if you pop the lid, then that popped up, remember? And there you could stand in there. Yeah, you could. Well, you could, too, if we put the, the thing up, remember? Yes, I could stand. I, I, it was like <laughs> yeah, three good... steps I could take. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, no, but, I mean, overall, Jen's right. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. And, um, you know, any minor discomforts were worth it because it was, it was so cool. Uh, really, the best way to travel, period. Just, so, speaking of that, describe a perfect long weekend in a camper van. Mm. Well, that would be one where Mr. Ham has already figured out our route <laughs> and rough idea of what we're doing, because I tend to overthink everything and overplan everything, and um, so it's really a pleasure for me when somebody else does that and I get to be surprised and just kind of go along. Um, so that would be that, and then we would probably head out early on a Saturday morning and skip the traffic, and... Well, we know where we're going. Maybe we don't have a solid plan about where we have to be at any particular time so that we can meander and stop if something looks interesting. And we would stop and uh, maybe have a little picnic or something. If our dogs were interested in balls, we'd throw the ball for them. But, of course, these two could care less about a ball. <coughs> yep. Dob used to love to chase a ball. Yep. Love, love, love. So, um, let's see. Then get back on the road, see some more amazing landscape and probably some nice architecture um yeah eventually get to where we're going maybe stop somewhere along the road where we have uh, like when we we're driving back from the peak district to uk games expo we just were driving along and there was a sign for a local creamery so we pulled off and went in and had some lovely local ice cream just taking advantage of whatever we come across that way um get to our place say five o'clock or something at night so we can choose a good spot at probably a campsite but in England you can also camp wild without any problem so I don't know just get to somewhere that we'd want us to spend the night and yeah probably I don't know if we're hungry cook something if not no big deal I don't know just very relaxed and casual they're just I think the main thing for me is the lack of having to be anywhere at any particular time so yeah, but that's kind of at odds with what he said, because he just said, describe the perfect long weekend. And what you're talking about is more appropriate if you're going to spend a couple of weeks on the road. Well, I think you could I mean, if, if, if you're just doing a long weekend, I think there's going to be more pressure and you can't be quite so laissez-faire about, oh, we'll just do whatever we'll do. Because you only have three days. Yeah. You got to get there and get back. And okay. so, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I, we haven't done that. Whenever we've used the camper van, whether it was the Prague trip or the, the France trip or the Irish trip or the Scottish trip or, you know, any of mm -hmm. them. I mean, those were long, you know, one, two, three week long things. True. So that we could uh, proceed in the way that Jen just described. I don't know what a long weekend would be. I, I think it would feel very different. And I don't think it would be as satisfying when it boils right down to it because we'd feel more driven to, well, no, we got to get to X. Yeah, I'm trying to even think if we've ever done just a weekend trip. I don't think so. I don't think we have. No. Come to think of it. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. And then final question from Daniel. I think it's a bit facetious. How are both of you so awesome? 
Oh, uh, thank you. You just don't know us, Dan. <laughs> <That's> uh, <kind. laughs> let's see. Back to Natalie. What kind of snacks or drinks ha um, are being served on your game nights? Oh. Well, we don't do game nights. Well, but if we have people over, we'll, we usually have those delicious salted peanuts from Little. Yeah. Those are awesome. Um, usually people will bring something over, so we'll, of course, get into that. Um, I usually make some sort of egg concoction, like a quiche or soup. I always make soup. If, we, if we're expecting to feed people. Because those are just easy things that are already cooked and you can just ladle them out when you're ready to eat. Mm. Do you have any different snacks, drinks for your three or four player <clears throat> games? So her first question was just us. Oh, just us. Our first question, we don't. I don't <laughs> we don't really eat or snack at all while we play games. It's just the two of us. Well, uh, we no. pretty much keep it separate. I think pretty rarely. Maybe every once in a while, but pretty rarely. Maybe... If there were potato chips in the house. Oh my gosh, I love potato chips. Because we're both weak and we'll eat those anytime, anywhere, doing anything. Um, so Jen was actually just answering your three or four player rarity circumstance. Um, for both of you, what are your favorite types of clothing? Comfortable clothes. Skirts, t-shirts, hoodies, etc. Um, I'm going to go with... I like one long... I like long dresses that don't have waist. Long dresses that don't have waists. Yeah, like okay. that purple dress I was wearing earlier today. That is your favorite type of clothing. Yeah, you just throw it on and you're done. Okay. Yep. So you like potato sacks, is what you're saying. Yep, there you go. Potato okay. <laughs> um, uh, just shorts and t-shirt, I suppose. And flip-flops, if the weather allows. That would be my favorite, I guess. That's pretty much all I own. Let's see here. Oh, actually, my favorite type of pants, though, are convertible pants. You know, you can turn into shorts or just leave them as pants. But the problem is, as near as I can tell, they've completely stopped making cotton fabric ones. You can only get those now as, you know, like kind of the camper pants that are, yeah, I don't know, poly or not polyester, but they're, they're plastic. Yeah. Hate that. Quick dry ones. Quick dry. Don't want that. Just want a nice, comfortable pair of shorts that I can turn into pants if I need it, please. Made out of 50% cotton, 50% polyester, or whatever. <laughs> and they've just, as near as I can tell, those literally do not exist. If anybody knows where they exist, please tell me, and I will order lots of them before they disappear. Because uh, I don't I don't want to go camping. I just want to have shorts, that, and then occasionally I need to turn them into pants. Because that's so much to ask. Anyway. Let's see here. GG. Uh, what? Oh, oops, oh, yeah, oh, sorry, I'm right. M next up, we have Yan, or Jan, who wonders if I have tried having a map with dots or symbols showing the location, I guess country, of my Rado Runs Through supporters. Just a thought for a future stretch goal. I don't know, I haven't really thought about that. I If if that was a feature that Patreon offered, I'd, sh I'd turn it on, surely. Jen's got that on her website, jennifer.net. Yep. And it was just some plugin you found, right? Yeah, for Etsy. Oh, it was an Etsy plugin? Yep. Yeah, I would totally do that, but I don't want to do it enough to actually seek out how to do it, if there is a way to do it. <sighs> but if Patreon had that, man, I would turn that on to heartbeat because that'd be really awesome. I, in fact, now I'm thinking I'm going to write an email to Patreon saying, why don't you support this? Etsy does it. It's awesome. Hmm, okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It would be. It's not Etsy. It's some guy that wrote something for Etsy, but... Oh, okay. Maybe we should email him. Contact say, that guy. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be awesome. All righty. Uh, right. So, uh, Paul says that due to fostering three children and having two of our own as well, our daily lives are a whirlwind of domesticity, chaos, love, laundry, and bath times. When the evening comes and everyone is asleep, the wife and I will sit next to each other and maybe watch a trashy TV show and eat a few olives and chorizo. Mm. It's a very small pocket of the day, and it's our calm space that seems to reset us, bring on peace, and puts everything in perspective. Uh, that everything we do is worth the hectic days. Uh, so, what is Jen's and my happy place that resets our clock and makes everything feel all right? The pocket of the day, or um, where, where you get your breath, and you feel everything is in its right place, even though you know... There's massive things ahead of you. 
Wow, I think we live a much calmer life than he does. I imagine so, <laughs> oh, yes. Not having five kids. Two beagles, a little bit less stress involved there. Yeah. Um, I would almost say, though, probably the unwinding at the end of the day when we just sit down and watch TV. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we watch TV most every night. I don't know. And I'm always surprised by that because I think Jen kind of fought against that for years, mm. not wanting to give in to the to being a couch potato. <laughs> Whereas I have always embraced it ever since I was a little kid. Yeah. Uh, so what has signaled this change, honey, that you don't mind watching a couple hours of shows every night? Well, you do such a good job of finding TV shows I'm interested in. <clears throat> yeah. And I think also the quality of programming has gotten so much better. I mean, imagine all the crap that we watched as kids. I mean, and sitting down to watch it now, you, I, it would not hold my attention mm -hmm. at all. And I would not, I would just think, oh, I can't believe I wasted half an hour of my life on that. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it's just, I think programming is just really, really good now. And, and we would should you, take advantage of it. Would you say the advent of streaming binge watchable shows? Is that, you know, the fact, I mean, because that's not something we used to be able to do 10 years ago. True. And also the fact that we can totally skip commercials. Yeah. So it's a very efficient use of my time. Mm. Uh, one thing that just bugs me, though, is the redundancy of, of in programming is when you I think that the producers assume that somebody doesn't just sit down and watch TV. They probably got kids or something and um, their attention is split. But, you know, I sit down and Jen's I watch talking TV. About, you're talking about like nature shows and, and like you, you, you love the veterinarian reality shows and stuff like that. Not trashy reality shows, you know, like Beverly Hills Wives or anything like that, but. One's about vet, vets in the Yukon and stuff like that. Yeah. And they have a tendency to repeat themselves a lot. Yeah. So The reason constantly. for that is because the shows are still packaged and marketed to where there's going to be commercial breaks. every. I, mean, I know we don't watch the commercials, but there's commercial breaks every 15 minutes. <laughs> and they have to assume after every commercial break, they've just got people. They've just switched over from something else because the commercials all happen around the same time. So they have to keep repeating themselves. Mm. Try and hook people in. Yes. Well, it drives me crazy. Yep. Because I was paying attention. <laughs> I don't need to refresh. But right. Other than that, I think the programming is really good. Okay. Um, Danny wonders. Oh, yes. Here we go. Honey, why is your favorite city London? Five things that make it your favorite city in the world. Oh, go. go. Well, okay, obviously, the sense of history. That place is absolutely amazing. Everywhere you look, there is something interesting to look at. I don't care where you are. Um, and there's just little teeny tiny things to notice. There's huge things to notice. There's far-reaching views to be enjoyed. I just, everywhere I look in London, something cool is going on. Uh, I don't know how many things that is. That's got to be... I think that was one. No, that's got to be a couple of them, because it is so huge. That is just a sense of history and, and great views. All right, that's two. And interesting architecture. That's, that's three. three. Um, of course, there's any kind of food you want in London. Okay. I love that. Um, that's four. Okay. Uh, and I think it's a very friendly city. I, I, I feel very comfortable walking around by myself um, all the time. I Yeah, okay, I'm going to say the nice people. Okay, nice people. Yep. Great. Um, let's see here. I think that was it. Oh my gosh. From, no, no, no. That was just it from uh, Danny. All righty. And yes, moving on to Thomas, who asks, is wondering if myself, if I or Jen are manual folk, which is to say if something breaks in the house, <laughs> are we able to repair it? Or is the first reflex to call a specialist? I'm pretty much going to try and MacGyver a solution. Yep. Jen, uh, you're talking about Jen there. Jen wants to fix everything herself. And I think life is too short for such things. Yep. Yep. That's basically what it boils down to. Yep. But how often have you been pleased that I was able to fix something? Sure. Uh, yeah, he's happy. He just wants it fixed. Whether I fix it or somebody else fixes it, he doesn't want to fix it. Yeah. Uh, unless, of course, it's co computers, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Then he's totally... That's his thing. Yep. And then I fix it. Uh, right. Daniel Honey Pie says, Considering we've been to so many places, traveling and living, what are some must-try local foods that we can recommend? Local to where? He didn't say. To wherever we've been? 
Just uh, yeah, just what what food stands out uh, from all your travels? Oh, I mean, there's fabulous stuff to eat wherever you are. Um, why don't I just say instead that I love Ethiopian food? And if you haven't tried Ethiopian food, you really should. It's awesome. You can get it in all kinds of spicy levels, from mild to blow your socks off. But the really great thing about it is it's communal eating. So they serve you the food on a big communal platter. And it's um, sitting on a bed of something that looks kind of like a pancake. And the pancake absorbs uh, the extra oils and, and goopiness out of the sauces that are put on it. Um, and basically, you're, you're, you eat with a, another different pancake, a separate pancake, not the one with all the food sitting on. And you just tear this little bit of pancake into, into strips and use your fingers to um, grab the sauces and the meats and the legumes and stuff that's on the platter um, with this pancake. And then you stick the pancake holding the meat into your mouth. Does that make sense? And it's just such an awesome experience to eat with your fingers and to share, I think, a meal so communally like that because you're eating off the same plate. It's just awesome. Good answer. I'll go with that. Uh, last one, Honey Pie. As always, or almost always, I think Henrik missed it one month. Oh, dear. We need the, the wisdom? He wants to hear Jen's wisdom of the month. Oh, okay. This one's pretty um, easy going, but that's where I am in, at this point. It is a quote by Anita Krizan, K-R-I-Z-Z-A-N. And you have no idea who that is? I don't have any idea who it is, but it is attributed, so I will attribute it. All right. Um, she says, you don't have to move mountains, simply fall in love with life. Be a tornado of happiness, gratitude, and acceptance. You will change the world just by being a warm, kind-hearted human being. And I think that's lovely. We can all do that. Okay. That, that last bit was me. <laughs> all right. I think that's lovely. We can all do that part was me. That was not Anita. All right. But I'm sure she agrees. I imagine she would. All right. Well, that's it, folks. Another one um, in the books. And if you'd like, you can come back next month. And once again, we will try to tell you about new games and talk about top tens and answer all your questions that you sent as always to questions at rotto.com. And I'm going to say thanks very much for watching or listening in this case. Have a nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.